maybe look up an article that I want to share with our, our viewers. Um, COVID-19 is also known as SARS-CoV-2. And this, what I'm about to read you, is from the journal Virology, which is pub the official publication from the National Institutes of Health. And it says, severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is SARS, is caused by a newly discovered coronavirus. No effective prophylactic or post-exposure therapy is currently available. So the study went on to look at different medications that might work for this new SARS-CoV. They discovered that chloroquine has strong antiviral effects treated with the drug, if the patient's treated with the drug either before or after exposure to the virus, suggesting it is both prophylactic and therapeutic advantage. It goes on to say a little bit about the, the SARS-CoV. SARS-CoV is an emerging disease that was first reported in Guangdong province, China. They've identified chloroquine as an effective antiviral agent. <clears throat> the study went on to say we provided evidence that chloroquine works. The fact is that the drug has significant inhibitory antiviral effects when susceptible cells are treated either prior to or after infection. The reason I decided to talk about this study right now is that sure sounds like what we're in the middle of, yeah? We've got a severe respiratory distress illness came from China. We don't know if chloroquine works or not. Well, I'm here to tell you that the virology study was published in 2005 from the National Institute of Health. Friends, we've been down this road before. We've had this before. We've known for many years that it was very likely that chloroquine would work for this disease. I encourage everybody to look up this article, published by Virology, 2005, National Institute of Health. Dr. Fauci was the director of the National Institute of Health at that time, so surely he knew of this study. He's not the author, but he surely knew of it. He was the director. <coughs> And I hope that when you hear things like this, you understand that doctors know what to do in this situation. This is not brand new. It's been given the name novel coronavirus. I don't know why it's been given that name. As you heard from Dr. Erzo, it's related to many other coronaviruses, and it's acting exactly as we would expect a coronavirus would act, and we have treatment that can help you. I'm gonna introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Hamilton esteemed pediatrician who's going to talk to us about the effect of the virus on children and how that implicates school policies. Well, thank you uh, for this. Thank you for being here and thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, Simone, thank you for the work that you do. So I am Bob Hamilton. I'm a pediatrician in Santa Monica, California. I've been in practice there for 36 years. I am here, I don't represent, uh, I'm actually here on my own. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. I don't have stock in Gilead or any other, uh, any, anything else. And I'm here as a private citizen and I will tell you that I'm also here as an advocate for children. So <clears throat> it, um, I'm going to share with you briefly and, and uh, where is a watch? I can watch my time here. Uh, somebody give me about 20 minutes. Somebody put their hands up, if you would. So I'd like to talk to you briefly about uh, COVID and children. And some of this is review. I mean, uh, those of you who are in the room certainly know this information. Those of you who are watching online, uh, you many of you know this information too. But basically, the points I want to make are, number one, kids are actually doing very, very well with this infection. It turns out that the number, uh, I was here a, sh a few weeks ago, we were talking about a percentage of total children being, uh, of all cases of COVID, kids represented about one point. 7%, that was about a month or two ago. That number has now increased to about 8% of all COVID cases, about 8% of them are occurring in the zero to 18 age category. Okay, so there's a bump there. Now, that actually, actually it's a big bump. It's about a 46% bump uh, that really began in the first weeks of July. The reality is that uh, we are testing more and probably we're finding more uh, children who have COVID because it was always there, but they were asymptomatic. And, and in fact, in my own practice in Santa Monica, we've had about uh, eight to 10 cases that we have found uh, positive. Why do we check these kids? Well, majority of them, by the way, were asymptomatic. We checked them because either their mother or their father was positive. And when we checked them, lo and behold, they were positive too. 
you would never know it. They were feeling perfectly fine. They were doing very, very well. But now we're doing the checking. We're doing checking in mass. Uh, those of us in California certainly know that we have lines out the door uh, to check for coronavirus, and we're finding it. But the good news is that children are doing very well. People should know that the mortality rate uh, for children, I think in the country we're up to about 36 children under uh, the age of 14 who have died. Um, that, uh, is, that, that mortality rate represents about one-fifth of one percent, okay, which is a very, very low mortality rate. So that is a, a point uh, which is encouraging. Um, number two I'd like to make, and that is that children are really not transferring this virus from themselves to adults, okay? The, if you look at, uh, right now, the Europeans have gone back to school, about 22 countries in Europe are, have been, uh, have re, uh, brought their, uh, their re, uh, what, re-enrolled their, their students in schools. And uh, the truth be told that there has not been a big bump in, in coronavirus after that re-enrollment. Uh, they began this in uh, the Denmark, uh, Denmark schools went back mid-April. The other schools of, in Europe have gone back May, and they're doing quite fine. Uh, they, did do some, they did do some changes. They did some distancing. They cut down the size of the school classrooms, and they were also uh, careful about the staff. Uh, staff, of course, are usually older, and uh, they have made those adjustments, but they're doing very, very well. There was a study that came out of Korea a couple days ago. The New York Times has picked up on it. LA Times has picked up on it. They're kind of making the case that children are, in fact, a potential spreaders. Uh, when you look at that, that study, they looked at about 5,900 cases, what we call index cases, and they then traced about 59,000 household contacts of these 5,000, 5,700 uh, index cases and found that children over 10 years of age do spread the infection to their parents, other people in the family. Under 10, they're about half as likely to pass on the infection to uh, family members. Now, mind you, it's important that you realize this is a, in the home, in the home. Uh, and we're talking about Korea. I looked it up. The average size of a, an apartment in most Koreans, I've been to Korea. Korean is a very dense population, and they live in apartments. Even in the country, they live in apartments. The average size of an apartment in Korea is about 1,100 square feet. That's the average. Okay, That means that there are many who are, which, which are smaller, larger too. So you can understand that the potential of them having very intense contact with sick individual is quite high. So it doesn't come as a surprise necessarily that children over 10 in particular, and when you're, they're over 10, some of these over 10 kids are, are that tall. <laughs> they act like an adult, and in fact, they are, they are spreading it. But that is in the house, okay? When you think about schools, you're not in the house when you're in a school, right? You're in a, you're, it's a very different environment. So even though the New York Times is using that as information, maybe they shouldn't go back, and the, and the LA Times is using that, the truth be told, is it really isn't uh, happening. There, um, I want to reference an article which is going to be published next month in August in uh, Pediatrics, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics kind of journal that we put out monthly. The title of the article is COVID-19 Transmission in Children. The children, the child is not to blame. And this uh, study looks at information from a se several countries, uh, China, uh, Switzerland, um, Australia, all around, it really doesn't show that there's any indication that children are, the, in fact, the drivers of this infection. So that is a very important point in, in getting our kids back to school because people are concerned about that. The other uh, thing I want to make a comment about is the, the failure of online Zoom education. I think we all kind of know this, but when you think about education, what, when you think about schools, what is the purpose of a school? Well, the purpose of the school is to educate children, okay? And if you're doing that in an online environment, you're relying upon not teachers per se, but you're really relying upon parents who are trying to work from home possibly or not at home because they got to go to work and these 
kids are not being well monitored. And I will tell you that a study um, came out uh, looking at a typical year versus what is coming, you know, what is happening now. And about, they're, they're predicting that children going back to school this year are going to have about 77% of their English uh, abilities, okay, what they should have learned, about 70%, as, as opposed to a typical year. And in terms of math, the kids this year ha are going to be about 50, they got about 50% of what they normally would get in a typical year they're going to be going back to school with. So the kids are really, truly losing out on education. That is a big problem. And really, we are putting a burden on families um, that is not theirs to, to bear, uh, particularly ch uh, families where the ch they have uh, special needs children. Uh, that puts a, a real... Uh, a real uh, burden on these families because they do not have, frankly, they don't have the resources to do what needs to be done. So we all know the virtual, the virtual education has really been a tremendous failure. Just a, a note from a Wall Street Journal had an article uh, a couple of months ago said that of uh, they looked at they looked at a study that uh, evaluated 477 schools that went online. They found that only 27% of the schools took attendance. In Philadelphia and Boston, only about 60%, 50 to 60% of the kids showed up <clears throat> daily uh, on a typical day. Only 42% of these 477 schools required homework, which is bizarre. They're, they're, they're at home. They're doing the, they're, you know, they're online. They're supposed to be doing Work. No, they're not, they didn't require any homework. Only 42% of them. In LA, uh, mind you, fully 15,000 kids, when they went online, this was in mid March, they went online. 15,000 high school kids, which is about a third of the population of the high school kids in Los Angeles, never, not one time, logged in. Okay? They're not getting an education. By the way, uh, the LA Unified School District, uh, they also said, by the way, FYI uh, uh, students, we're going to give you the grade that you have to this point in the class. We're going to give it to you. You know, you know. And so that isn't, I don't know about you, but that isn't much of an incentive. If they told me that uh, when I was a high school kid, I guarantee you I wouldn't like be running to my uh, computer every day to log in, right? Okay. Um, the last couple points I want to make uh, really have to do with the opposition. It, really, every major organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the, um, uh, the CDC, and uh, you all know uh, President Trump all, all the way down, they're saying we need to get our kids back in school. And everyone agrees. We all need to because they're not getting sick. They're actually tolerating it very well. Okay, why aren't we going to be going back to school? I'll tell you why we're not going to be going back to school. Because the unions, which really run the school systems across the country, are not going to allow it. And um, I do want to, Stephanie, if you're here, is Stephanie here? I, I want to pass out a document. So uh, I'd like to have you all in the room. Stephanie, can we pass those out? Thank you so much. Um, the, why aren't we going to go back? We're not going to go, go back because they're concerned about the adults in the room, okay? They, everyone agrees that kids are, are tolerating this infection unbelievably well. But when you really, uh, you know, the reason we, we're not going to go back is because people are concerned about parents. But I, I'm, I'm handing out this document because I think it's important that we kind of go through it kind of carefully and look at what they're saying. This is the, uh, the uh, white paper, I would call it, or uh, whatever you want to call this, prog progress report. They call the, the title of this, as you can see, the same storm but different boats, the safe and equitable conditions for starting LAUSD. LAUSD is a Los Angeles Unified School District. The, uh, this is being put out by UTLA, UTLA's United Teachers of, of Los Angeles. They are the teachers union in LA, okay? And uh, for starting LAUSD in 2021. The document really is, a, if you read it, it's a very angry document. It is very divisive. It is highly political. And frankly, um, it really kind of exposes who they are. As I have said to other people, I've said UTLA has really, in a city of masks, UTLA has unmasked itself because you really read this. If you look at paragraph two, 
uh, it says this, the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States underscores the deep equity and justice challenges arising from our profoundly racist, intensely unequal society. Okay, that's their foundation. So what they're kind of doing with this pandemic is they're, they're fusing uh, a lot of other things into their, their anger, I guess, or their demands. And this is important. If you look down on the, the, um, um, the fourth paragraph, it says the document outlines the equity lens that we must use to view both today's emergencies and tomorrow's Recovery. First, we ask who is suffering the most and why. And uh, they claim that they are deeply concerned about the kids, but let me tell you, they're, uh, I'd imagine, I think they're more concerned about politics. Look at page number three. It gives you a breakdown, demographic breakdown. They're in the right corner. You see that the, make, uh, the makeup of the LAUSD is a very highly minority makeup. We have 73% uh, of the students in LAUSD are actually Latinos. African Americans represent 8.2. Asians are 4.2. Uh, the white uh, students are actually only 10%. So that's, uh, that came as a little bit of a surprise to me. Turn over to page number six and you see uh, the pyramid that they have there and if you look at that pyramid here's how they want to equitably and safely restart the schools you see the foundation of that pyramid do you see what it says increase funding and uh, basically I want you all to know that the bottom line to this whole thing is money and you have to follow the money and when you, when you begin to do that, you really realize what this document is all about. It's all about money. And uh, if you look at the very top of the pyramid, in very tiny letters, it says, if you can read it, in-person learning. How about that? So they're, they're, it's very clear what, where their foundation is. Their foundation is we want more money. And uh, I turn over with me, me to page number nine. Um, page nine, kind of the uh, mid paragraph there, these estimates, okay, no, the bottom paragraph, sorry, unfortunately, I'm quoting here the document, unfortunately, instead of flattening the curve, politicians and the billionaires they, they serve have instead flattened school budgets and our capacity to safely restart schools. Uh, in California, okay? So uh, they're blaming the billionaires and the politicians um, in California that they, they actually, it's a very weird thing because California is a, a completely demographic, uh, de uh, democratic state, uh, just FYI. Everything is controlled by the, uh, the Democrats. So I'm not really sure what politicians they're referring to. Uh, and I'm not really sure what billionaires are referring to as well, because a lot of our billionaires in California actually happen to be on the left, not on the right. Okay, so if you look at what they're asking for, and this is where the money comes in, and we'll read through this briefly, and then I'm going to give you some good news. Okay, uh, they look at the, if, on page 10, they have federal support, then state support, and then page 11, you see local support. It's worth reading through these, because I think, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So federal support, they want a federal bailout. They're pretty clear about it. Number one, they want a federal bailout. They've already gotten money through CARES and HEROES Act. They want more money. And that's where it all comes down to. Number two, they want to fully fund Title, fully fund title One. Title One is something that has been passed a long time ago. Apparently, it's not fully funded. They want to fully fund IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which was passed in 1975. They're saying we need an update. We need to give more money for that because we're not, we don't have enough money for that. They want Medicare for all. Uh, that's a big jump. Uh, we're talking about the opening of schools, okay? And they're talking about Medicare for all. I'm sorry, but I'm not totally sure how they, they relate. It goes further. Uh, they go down to the state support, the California Schools and Local Communities Funding Act. This is a, a proposition on the California ballot. Basically, they're going, they want to change the tax laws, the property tax laws in California. It goes under that wonderful name, California Schools and Local Communities Funding. It sounds good, but look out. They also want to have a wealth tax. Uh, they want to tax the California billionaires. Um, there are only about 157 of them in California, but they're like keying in on these poor billionaires. I, I say poor billionaires. Um, but they're keying in on them. <laughs> 
<laughs> because they're great whipping boys. You know, you kind of, you know, of all people in the world that kind of beat up on you, you want to beat up on the billionaires. And they also are going to include a millionaire tax, and so they're going to add a 1% surtax on incomes over a million dollars a year. So if you make over a million dollars a year, in California, by the way, it's almost impossible to live in California if you don't make at least a half a million. Uh, those of you who live there know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, my, young, my young families in my practice, uh, they are, it's almost impossible for them to buy homes because the housing costs are so high. So two incomes there, they barely scratch it out. Okay, local support, here's what they want to do locally. You ready? Page 11, they want to defund the police. I'm not sure how that fits in with the education uh, objectives, but they begin with that, number one. Number two, they want housing security. We're talking about homeless housing security, and we're also talking about people who can't afford to pay their their monthly rent. They want to have support uh, housing security. They want uh, money for that. They want paid sick leave, more paid sick leave. They want a charter moratorium. This is important to comment on. They, there are a series of charter schools in Los Angeles these are things like KIPP, which is the, uh, KIPP is a group of, of charter schools, which means knowledge is power. I am intimately aware with that, of that uh, particular um, charter school group because my son-in-law happens to be the CFO of that uh, in Los Angeles. So they want to put a moratorium on charter schools, which simply means we close them all. And they say that, that the charter schools are diverting money from the, the pot. Uh, they are kind of correct in that regard, but I will tell you that the charter schools in L.A. are the ones that are teaching the kids. They really are pulling these kids uh, out of uh, media mediocrity into a very high level of education. Finally, they want, to, they want financial support for undocumented students and families. Uh, these are, we have a lot of undocumented uh, individuals in, in California, and they want to basically help them. And uh, I understand their impetus for that, but uh, this is more money, okay? And they also want to get rid of ICE, which is the, um, the uh, immigration uh, group who are trying to track down illegal immigrants in California. So in conclusion, what they write, normal wasn't working for us before, we can't go back. So what the people of California, people of LA, don't know is this is they don't know that basically our, our unions are de facto on strike. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna say we're on strike, but they're really gonna be holding the, the feet of, the, uh, of all of us, of the, the families, the parents, uh, to the fire because they really don't wanna go back because they have an amazing opportunity to really demand and get more money from not only the federal government, but local governments, although the local governments do not have money. So the only people out there who can really print money is the federal government. So they're looking at the federal government to really uh, to help them. Finally, I want to say, uh, so that's why the kids are not going to go back, you guys. It has nothing to do with medicine. It has nothing to do with how much kids, you know, transfer the virus. Uh, there, by the way, in the schools, there are ways of, of mitigating potential infection. You know, the whole idea of hand washing, distancing, staggering schedules. There are literally scores of ideas which are great ideas. Uh, you know, we don't want to get this infection. I don't want to get it. You guys don't want to get infected. And we don't want our teachers getting infected as well. But we can do it safely, and I think we, can, we should do it. But the people who are going to hold us back, here they are. And I, I, I went through this in detail because I think that this is probably reflective of a lot of, of uh, union, uh, unions around the country. I, they talk to each other. We know they do. They get ideas from each other. So this is, I don't think this is a, uh, an outlier. I think this is probably more in line with what's going on out there. Final thing I want to mention, uh, good news, and that is that parents in L.A. are, are getting fed up. They're weary, they're tired, and the, the prospect of having their children sit in front of a computer all day and do the Zoom education, which didn't work, we knew that already. I mean, I, and I talked to parents all day, I said, how did it work? Even kids who are going to very wonderful private schools, they shake their head and say, it didn't work too well, and we all know that, right? Okay, the parents are getting weary, they're getting, they're getting broken down, they're disheartened, what they're doing is they're forming what are now being called mini pods, mini pod educational units. They're gathering together with like-minded families who have uh, similar age, age uh, children, and they're essentially putting together maybe five, 10 kids together 
in a mini school, basically, hiring a teacher together, sharing, pooling the costs of that, and they're essentially forming, and I, I will tell you, there are thousands of these being formed. I, 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 this came out a week ago, and I was surprised. I literally heard about 10 different individuals, and some of these are pediatricians in our community who are saying, no, we want our children educated. We're not going to wait for the LA Unified School District. We're certainly not going to do the online thing. So what is happening is there is a backlash, a quiet backlash, which, which is occurring definitely in Southern California. I'm sure if this happens in Northern California, it happened up there as well, where parents are taking their children's education back, if you will. And listen, I that they're going to get a good education. I really do. I think it's going to turn out to be really quite, quite nice for a lot of these kids who do this. Um, I will say one last thing, and that is that UTLA and the school teachers unions are terrified about this movement. In fact, there was a memo put out by one of our local junior highs saying, if you are thinking about doing a mini pod, forming a mini pod and an educational unit, whatever you want to call it, this is this is contributing to the injustice of the educational system. So they're trying to infuse this idea through fear and guilt, whatever you want to put on people. They're terrified by that prospect. But uh, wouldn't it be ironic, you guys, if after all of this wrangling and all the, everything they, these guys go through, the LA uh, teachers come back to no kids. They're all gone. They're all being educated at home. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. So, um, yes. So even if somebody pays a lot of attention to these issues, I was very um, interested in what you had to say. There was a lot of things that you said that I had not been familiar with. First of all, I just want to make sure that our viewers can actually find this document. So this is, will you just tell them exactly how to, sure. find, how to find this? I, the way you go is you look at the uni, uh, LA Unified School District it is UTLA, uh, Los Angeles. The name of the document, if you uh, punch it in, the same storm but different boats, the safe and equitable conditions for starting LAUSD in 20, 2020, 20, 2021. And I think if you, if you Google that, you'll, you'll find it. And just to summarize, just because we spend so much time talking about the politics of why kids are not going back to school, I just want to make sure our viewers really got the message. So from a medical perspective, from a health perspective, are we okay sending our kids back to school? If <laughs> the schools are, are there uh, for them. Okay, listen. All I can say is that uh, Mark Woolhouse, uh, he's a guy from Edinburgh, Scotland. He said the following. It's worth ending the, my little talk on this note. He said, basically, there has been not one documentation of a child spreading coronavirus to a teacher documented and verified in the entire world. Okay, so... If, and by the way, he's a professor of infectious disease and epidemiology in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. You know, listen, I would, uh, even if he's half wrong, maybe there's one. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good, that's a, that's a statement that uh, he's not making lightly. So I think we can kind of take that uh, back to our, our communities and say, listen, we really do need to, in fact, get our kids back in school. Thank you. And... I think each age group should have a slogan to, for their own age group. So for me, correct me if I'm wrong, I think for kids and schools, it's all about don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Would that be true? Yeah, that's true. Especially if this mini pod thing, which I think is going to be a very interesting uh, development. We'll see where that goes. Thank you. Sorry. Luke, do we have confirmation that Dr. Barkey is, is on deck? All right. We're going to hear from uh, my colleague, Dr. Jeff Barkey, remotely. He is a primary care physician in, I believe, Orange County region. And he also has extensive experience with the school situation. So we look forward to hearing what he has to say. Is it? Proceed. 
Got it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this, especially mm -hmm. remotely. Uh, I'm a board certified primary care doctor. I practice in Orange County, California. <laughs> I'm also the co-founder of a local charter school and the board chair of this charter school called Orange County Classical Academy. And uh, up until very recently, we were scheduled to open live in person on August 13th. And the reason why we were going to open live in person is because I have been studying COVID-19 for many, many months. I treat COVID-19 patients in my office and have done so for many months now. And in Orange County and in all of California, as you have heard, there's been zero COVID deaths uh, throughout and zero in Orange County. And what we're learning about this virus is that children are relatively immune to it. When they do catch this virus, they do phenomenally well. They either have no symptoms or they have mild symptoms. And what we're also learning is children do not spread this virus to adults. So it's important to note that despite what our governor here in California has put forward, uh, we have a mechanism to safely open schools with almost no risk to children and certainly very little risk to their adult teachers. And the reason why we know this to be the case is when you look at schools that have been opening throughout the world, 22 countries in Europe, Germany, Finland, Sweden, et cetera, I have no idea how to make that as job. Dr. Hamilton had mentioned, there is not a single documented case anywhere in the world of the child passing this virus on to an adult. Even if that could happen, we have to remember that what a healthy society does is we protect the most vulnerable. And as we know from this virus now and studying it for the last several months, the most vulnerable are those older folks that have pre-existing conditions. We know that about 50% of deaths in the United States has occurred in nursing homes. And for the younger age group, um, we are very effective at treating this, and the risk in the younger age group and the healthy is very low. It's no more um, deadly and no more contagious than a seasonal influenza. And we never close the schools down in seasonal influenza. And if you look at the risk of a child or even a younger adult to this virus, you will see that there are far more risky activities that we participate in much greater risk of dying this summer than they do of dying from COVID-19. Child has a much greater risk of dying in an automobile accident on the way to school than they do from COVID-19. And we're hurting our children right now by keeping our schools closed. Um, many of the children in California um, get their meals as a result of school. There's a measure of kids that are qualifying for free and reduced lunch uh, in school and in some school districts that's as high as 50 percent and what that means is in some school districts 50 percent of the kids rely on the schools uh, to feed them. We also know that closing the schools disproportionately hurts those in the lower socioeconomic class and as a result of that um, we have learning loss that occurs naturally every summer and then when you keep the, clues, the schools closed, that learning loss even accelerates. And that is most severe in the lower socioeconomic class. And so in effect, the closing of the schools unnecessarily, the closing of the schools despite the science, is a form of racism. No, really. The black and brown community is disproportionately being harmed by those that say they want to help this community the most. And we have the mechanism to help, and that is through our schooling system. My charter school, for example, we have 360 children. Our school is full. We have a waiting list of over 250 kids, and we're ready to open and to open safely. There are some common sense activities that we can do in the schools to keep both the kids and the adults safe, and we are planning to do this. And that is some of the things that you're used to seeing now when you go into retail establishments. We do a temperature check, a non-touch temperature check of their forehead. We insist that anybody that isn't feeling well, that's sick, 
that has a temperature that they not be allowed to come into school and stay off campus. The same thing with teachers and staff and parent volunteers that are going to be in the classroom. We have a plan to sanitize the school regularly to make sure that it stays clean. We have a plan to use hand sanitizer multiple times a day for the children and good, a good hygiene. So we have mechanisms in place to do what we can do to keep the kids safe and to keep the adults safe. And by the way, if there is an at-risk adult in our school, we can keep that at-risk adult safe without requiring draconian measures on all the children that scientifically just are not um, correct. We know that masking of children is an unhealthy, unnecessary, not based on science activity that really serves no purpose other than to create more problems than it solves. To the extent that a teacher or even a parent is worried about this virus and they want to participate in an activity um, to help keep their kids safe, we're fine with that and schools should be fine with that. You know, if you think about California, and this is happening all over the nation, California has over 1,000 independent public school districts. Each of those school districts have elected boards of education. And if you've ever been to California, it's quite a diverse uh, state from very rural areas uh, to urban areas, uh, to the mountains, to the sea, uh, et cetera. And to impose a one size fits all strategy on our school districts is just not correct. It's not right and the parents don't want it. One of the largest school districts in Orange County is Tustin Unified. They did a survey of the parents to see which of the parents would be willing to send their kids back to in-person learning. And that survey was approximately 80% of the parents were willing to have their kids back in the schools physically and not do a remote learning. And this type of surveying is happening all over Orange County and the results are very similar. The vast majority of parents want their kids back in the schools. We forget that keeping the kids home is not just about keeping the kids safe. It's about control, and it's also about hurting the economy. It hurts the economy most in working class parents, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged parents that don't have the luxury of being able to pay for daycare so they can go to work, of don't have the luxury of being able to hire a tutor or create these micro school systems where groups of parents join together and hire a teacher uh, and create daycare scenarios so that so the parents can go to work. That's happening even in our school. So we've announced now that we have to open via distance learning. And the reason why we do that is our funding comes from the state. So if we go against the state mandate, then we won't get the funding to be able to operate our schools. Private schools, um, because they get funding directly from the parents, uh, are more likely to disobey the governor's orders than public schools. But we're required to follow the orders or not get funding. But even within our schools, even within our school, we have parents now that are going to be hiring teachers, that are going to be hiring tutors because they can afford to do so, to maintain their children's education. And many of our parents are not able to do that. They can't afford to do that. We'll do the best we can with distance learning. There's no question about it. But distance learning is a far, far worse substitute than in-person learning. Even the teachers unions, UTLA, that's the second largest teachers union in the entire country, acknowledged themselves that distance and remote learning via Zoom, via computer systems, et cetera, uh, just does not work. It fails and it fails disproportionately in the socioeconomically disadvantaged um, households. And that's just not right. tell you and to advocate on behalf of parents and behalf of children. It's critical that parents push back. The only way we're gonna be able to make a difference is for the individual parents to push back and to tell their governors and to tell their local legislators that they've had enough, that they want their children in school and to allow physicians and healthcare workers to follow the science in keeping the schools safe, and we can certainly do that. We have models throughout California of how to do that. 
the County Board of Education here in Orange County, California, passed an extensive white paper guidelines on how to open schools. The guidelines are out there. The ideas are out there. We just need to allow individual school districts to make those decisions, what's best for their community, uh, based on guidelines, based on what the parents want, and most importantly, based on what the children themselves want as well. My wife and I were up in Sacramento, that's the, uh, ca that's the uh, capital of California this past weekend. There was over a thousand parents and their children that showed up on the Capitol steps to ask and demand the governor to allow local control over these decisions and not mandated control from a top-down bureaucracy. And I think that's important. I think that's what we're all about here in America is local control and independence and not a top-down approach from, a, from, at least in California, from our empirical governor. So as a primary care physician who has treated numbers of COVID patients, as a matter of fact, the reason why I'm not with you in Washington, D.C. today, and I, and I uh, would love to have been, is because I have patients that I need to care for. As a matter of fact, I got a phone call from two new patients that found me uh, that recently tested positive for COVID-19. So I'll be in the office today communicating with them and putting them on a protocol to keep them safe. The other good news is we talk about the risk to students, the risk to parents, the risk to teachers, et cetera, is that when treatment is instituted early with mild symptoms, we're really good at treating this disease. Um, we get into trouble when we wait too long and we wait for uh, patients to be critically ill and to be well on their way in the course of this illness. When we treat this illness early with mild symptoms, and you'll hear more about this later, um, we are fantastic at treating this. We're getting better than ever. Hospitalization stays are shorter. I have a patient that just went home yesterday from about a, a week-long hospitalization. As a result of the treatment, um, he was uh, able to recover. He never required ICU care. And, uh, and because of early intervention, he's doing just fine. There's a local children's hospital called Chalk Children's Hospital of Orange County, where they've treated a number of children that have had COVID-19, and universally they do well. Rarely do they need to be hospitalized. And when they do need to be hospitalized, the hospitalization is for a very brief period, mainly for fluids, et cetera, um, and then they're sent home. Um, so children are relatively immune to this illness. Not one child has died in all of California due to COVID-19. There is no evidence that children are passing this virus on to adults. And we have plans to open the schools safely. Parents want the schools to be open. Uh, their health and well-being of children depend on our schools being open. Um, and it's important that we allow our schools to open safely, effectively, so our children can begin again their education that is so important for their well-being and for their mental health. I'll leave that here, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'll turn this back over to Dr. Gold, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you for a few minutes this morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Barkey. Um, so I hope all of our viewers are, I hope all of our viewers are getting a lot of information and will be advocating for their families and their communities and do what's best for the children. We're hearing over and over that from a medical perspective, uh, don't worry about your children. Send them to school as long as the schools can be open. But I'd like to turn now to my colleague, uh, Dr. Mark McDonald, who's a child psychiatrist. And he has a lot of experience with what's going on with children and adolescents during the lockdown period. Thank you. What's the time frame? I am a practicing child and adolescent psychiatrist in West Los Angeles, and I see primarily children as well as adults. And I can tell you that the state of our children is abysmal. I have seen a rapid and substantial increase in emotional illness with all of the children in my practice, every single one. Anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, bedwetting, self-harm, child abuse, 
violence, panic attacks. I could go on and on and on. A parent came to me last week and said, I tried to take my eight-year-old daughter to the beach. <coughs> she grabbed my leg and she said, Daddy, we can't go to the beach. And he said, why can't we go to the beach? And she said, Daddy, because there are other people there. This little girl was completely well and completely healthy until this pandemic began. The pandemic in my mind is not so much a medical pandemic, it's an emotional pandemic. And this emotional pandemic is based on and centered around fear. The fear is real, but it's not based on reality. I have tried to provide facts, data, statistics, information to my patients and their parents for weeks and months. Uh, some of them do listen. Uh, some of them do change their minds because they believe that there is probably more going on than what they're being told, and what they're being told is probably not entirely accurate, and a lot of it is misinformation, but very many of my parents and children don't respond to information. I'm a big proponent of facts. I'm a big proponent of information. I'm a big proponent of science. I'm a physician. That's how I was trained. But I also know that unless we deal with this fear and we take it and face it head on, the information will not be of use. You cannot use information, no matter how accurate it is, unless you are in a calm state of mind. Anybody who's worked in the military knows this. When you are in a state of panic, when you are terrorized, when you are traumatized, you cannot think clearly. Most of the adults in my practice with children that come in for treatment are in that state. They are not responsive to information. They are allowing fear to guide their decisions. They're refusing to bring their children in. They're insisting on Zoom or telephone calls. They're preventing their children from playing outside. They're preventing their children from going shopping with them. They're preventing their children from participating in sports. They're coddling their children because they think that that's what's best for them. The children are suffering. In my view, this is child abuse. We are training an entire generation of children to live in fear, to live in fear of people. We are training an entire generation of children to live in their parents' basements until they're 40 years old so that they can be safe. And I've heard this word safe for months now. Whenever I hear the word safe, I always ask the following question, compared to what? Compared to driving? As we heard earlier, driving is far more dangerous far, far more dangerous than going to school. Safer than staying at home? <laughs> Children are getting sick at home. They're getting fat. They're wetting their beds. <coughs> They're attacking their brothers and sisters with kitchen knives. As two children did last week, I heard from the mother, she went to work. She doesn't have a babysitter. She's a single mother in Santa Monica. She's making minimum wage. She got a call from her neighbor saying the police are on the way. Why? I heard screaming. She rushes home. She finds out that her children have been fighting with knives. And these children are good kids, but they didn't know what to do. They went off Zoom after five minutes. They were bored. They got into an argument. One of the kids ate the other kid's watermelon, and pretty soon they're attacking one another with knives. Is she going to lose her children? I don't know. She's a good mother, but what can she do? She has to choose. Stay home, go on unemployment, or go to work. When she heard that the schools were going to be closed for another year, she burst in tears. She said, I'm going, to, I'm going to send my kids back to their home country. We can't survive. Other parents have told me the same thing. A lot of the immigrant parents are sending their kids back to their home countries because it's safer there than it is in America. Imagine that. They move away from a poor country to the United States and they send their kids back because it's safer there. Why is this happening? Why are we living in this state of fear, this pandemic of fear? My belief is that there has been an unholy alliance 
made between certain politicians, certain media, and special interest groups. Dr. Hamilton spoke very much in detail and provided excellent information about one of those special interest groups, which is one of the most powerful in the country. It is the most powerful in the state of California where I'm from. It provides the, the largest contribution financially to the governor, to the county, to the city, and that is the teachers union. And they have effectively told parents that if you send your kids back to school, the moment that they cross the threshold, they will die. And before they die, they will kill all the teachers. This is not an error. This is not um, naive. This is a lie. It is a cynical, manipulative lie to hold the children hostage for personal gain. It is evil. We made a mistake in March as a country. The single biggest mistake, in my view, which was to close our schools. Without schools open, nobody can work. And when nobody can work, we don't have an economy. And without an economy, we have a country of dependency. We have a country where we do not have the right or capacity to exercise choice. And this choice can be from whether to work, whether to go to school, all the way down to what direction we walk at our local supermarket. I believe that the only way for us to move forward and to properly address the medical aspect of coronavirus is to first reject the fear. We have to acknowledge that we are deeply, deeply afraid as adults. And we have to choose to push through this fear and to make the right choices for ourselves and for our children. If we do not do this, if we fail in this challenge, we will consign an entire generation of Americans to stunted development, to failure, to a life of incredibly limited potential. And I think that would be a deep, deep tragedy. So choose to push through the fear. Choose to reject the lies and the manipulation that you are hearing from your local politicians, from your media, from your teachers' unions. They do not have your best interest at heart. They purport to tell you what is best for you and your children. You know better. Make the right choice, push through the fear, and then we can all deal with this medical pandemic safely, simply, and effectively. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Wow. I want to I thank my colleague, Dr. McDonald, for really putting this in perspective. You know, another fine America's frontline doctor, right? We've got lots of them, thousands of America's frontline doctors all around the country, and it's time that Americans hear from them. We want to care for America. We want to improve our country. We want to go back to a state of healing and health, and I want to thank you so much. So we've concentrated um, up until now on the youngest members of our society, but we're going to shift to the other end. Uh, one of the reasons I structured the day like this is we have been upside down in how we've handled this as from a policy perspective. Every day I hear from parents about the school situation. Is it safe for my kids to go back to school? I get more texts and emails and comments on social media. Can I send my kids back to school? And my answer is the kids are fine. As we've heard, it's the school systems that are sick, not the kids. On the other end of the spectrum, we have our older patients. But I'd like to divide those older patients and our older members of our society into two groups. People can be very healthy when they're older. So we're going to talk about the healthy older population, and then we'll talk about the more frail older population. So I welcome my colleague, Dr. Taryn Clark. If you could just say a few words about your background, please. I okay, will do. Thank you for having me today. My name is Dr. Taryn Clark, and I'm a neurologist. I practice in Southern California. Um, and as a doctor practicing neurology, my primary focus of my clinic is on cognitive health. So that ends up lending to seeing a lot of patients with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And so 
the people I treat are really the primary population that are at risk. We've talked about children not particularly being at risk from serious disease from COVID, but at the other end of the spectrum, um, age is a major risk factor, dementia is a risk factor, and so I'm here to advocate on behalf of my patients um, and the population I treat and talk about how we might shepherd them back into society as we continue to reopen. So. This, this population is vulnerable and we've been protecting them. And so to protect them, we shut down our entire society and we isolated them. And so when we think about how the lockdown looked to us, most of us in the room um, are working. We were essential workers. We probably continued to get out of the house and do most of the things we need to do. Um, but how did it look to seniors who were locked down? Um, and made to stay at home. So I hardly meet anybody in my personal life whose uh, family has not been touched personally by Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. And so I think that we all can relate to the plight of um, that vulnerable population and the plight of their caregivers. So what the lockdown looked like to them was being stuck at home having the senior day programs that primarily provide activities to prevent premature institutionalization of our uh, memory impaired community uh, shut down, senior centers where people go to exercise that have uh, senior gyms and um, exercise classes were also closed, their art classes, um, their current events classes, all of that. Um, in our community, we even had a lot of our pedestrian walkways that are outdoors completely closed down. So if we step back a minute and talk about dementia and risk factors for that, the two uh, modifiable risk factors that always come out in every study at the top of the list are physical exercise and socializing. And so for people with dementia, we've taken those away from them. And for older Americans who are at risk, we've taken that away from them as well. So we actually did exactly opposite what we should have done with their health. Um, and that's, well, we'll save the senior residential side um, to our next speaker. And I'll just concentrate on um, people who live in the community and our seniors. So as we reopen, there, there's been a lot of um, concerned that we're reopening too quickly and cases are going up. And I think to, to quote Simone, we really should be not talking about cases, but positive tests. So there are a lot more positive test results. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are sick. Many, many, if not most of the positive tests we have are people who have no symptoms at all of COVID. Um, and so there's been this concern of, are we moving too quickly to open up? And we do need to be particularly sensitive when we talk about getting seniors back into the mix um, and doing that in a logical uh, way with some common sense. And so what happens, and I, I come to you not only as a physician who treats dementia, but as a caregiver um, with a, a mother who is um, in a senior residential facility. And so there, there has been a big push. When we don't get to see our loved ones for three months, um, you know, patients who could advocate for themselves, uh, residents uh, felt imprisoned and were pushing to have in-person visits. Uh, loved ones were ready to not be talking through the window to their loved ones. Um, and so there was a big push to reopen society for seniors. But the problem with so many things um, is that we go from zero to 60 without much thought. And that's exactly what happened in California. Um, there are a lot of speakers here from California today, so we, we probably have a very clinical, similar clinical experience, but we really started to see this uptick in cases in mid-June, um, huge increase. And that was almost the exact same timing that the uh, California Department of Social Services decided to allow uh, in-person uh, in visits. visits. Thank you. <laughs> In-person visits to um, nursing homes and residential care facilities. So the timing could not have been poorer um, as we were seeing cases everywhere than to 
to reintroduce society into residential facilities. So we really need to find a middle ground where we can attend to the health needs of seniors, but at the same time attend to their emotional needs. It can't be completely one or the other, and that's what we've been doing. So when I look at protecting my seniors, and this has been um, uh, a new focus for my clinic actually over the last uh, recent weeks, um, you know, we look at extrinsic factors to keep our seniors safe, and that's personal protective equipment, masks, distancing, but we don't talk a lot about the intrinsic factors. We don't talk about the senior immune system. And obviously there are a lot of problems with this, the senior immune system that sets them up for this virus to win. Um, so I've been working on addressing that. Um, and some of these risk factors are quite simple. One thing I'm doing as I spoke about um, lifestyle is we've got to get people out and exercising and in the fresh air. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions I see is that when the World Health Organization um, did finally agree, and that's how it was publicized, that they finally agreed that this was an airborne illness, I found that a lot of my patients took that to mean that the virus is floating about in the air and so they shouldn't go outside and exercise. So a lot of it is just education, that, that it isn't float, we're not going to catch this just outside and exercising. Um, and socializing is, as much as we can, I try to get people out on their front lawn, on their porch, even if they're just watching people walk by. We've got to get people outside and re-engage in a way that's low risk, and that is. Um, in terms of looking at the immune system of seniors, there are some really simple things um, that we know about the senior immune system that we can address. Currently, there is a clinical trial on melatonin and prophylaxing healthcare workers uh, to try to prevent them from catching COVID. And the, the theory behind that is we've known for a long time that melatonin has a lot to do with the immune system. When you think about when you're sick, you have to sleep, and that's part of the reason. Um, are those melatonin levels. And when we look from children to middle age to adulthood, um, or to being a senior, the melatonin levels are very high in children. In midlife, they start to drop. And most people who've been through that in this room uh, will attest that we don't sleep as well. And seniors have very little melatonin at all. So these are some things that are easy to address. Having um, seniors on melatonin will probably help them sleep, but probably does help their immune system. And it's a no harm compound. This is something we produce in our bodies anyway, so we're not gonna be allergic to it. Vitamin D is another well-studied vitamin that um, has been shown to decrease the risk of upper respiratory tract infections and uh, decrease the length and severity. Um, and se seniors are at high risk for having low vitamin D. I've always checked it in my cognitively impaired patients. And even in California, where you would think we would have outstanding vitamin D levels, um, at least half of the time I find people are vitamin D deficient. So that's another area where we can be boosting up the immune system, certainly for our patients. Vitamin C, I don't really think we need to belabor, but vitamin C is obviously part of that. Um, and the last piece is um, a compound that I recommend to most of my patients. I do some stratus stratifying um, based on their comorbidities and different risk factors to find the right strength and if they might need a prescription prophylaxis, but most of my patients um, end up with quercetin and zinc. And those are really interesting compounds. Um, the quercetin is an over-the-counter, um, it's, a, it's a quinone, it's related to hydroxychloroquine, it's a, flav a flavonoid and you find it in red wine, onions, but I don't want my patients to drink enough red wine or eat enough onions um, to get the amount they need, so we use supplements. And it's really an interesting compound for the immune system. It does two different things. The first thing it does is it changes the pH of um, endosomes in these white cells. And the way I explain that to my patients is if there's a cell and it, it kind of grabs all the gunk around viruses, intracellular parasites, and it puts it in a trash bag inside the cell. Um, and then it's supposed to dispose of it. So the first thing that that compound does is it increases or it changes the pH so that the virus will literally fall apart within that little trash bag. If the pH doesn't get changed enough and it gets through the side of that, then it can infect the cells and take over the mechanism and it reproduces itself and then goes out to infect other cells and other people. 
So the first part is trying to prevent it from really even getting a hold of the cells in the first place and taking over and reproducing itself. The second thing it does is it's called a zinc ionophore, which is a zinc lever, and so it pulls in zinc. And if you've been following um, the story with um, COVID, zinc is really important in most of the regimens to treat early disease. So the quercetin pulls the zinc into the cells, and we don't get a lot of zinc in our cells without something to pull it in. And what happens there is when the virus wants to reproduce itself, it needs an enzyme, and that enzyme is inhibited by zinc. So these are really simple compounds that we can use relatively safely to try to prepare the immune systems of our seniors for COVID and um, give them a much better chance to beat this disease. So thank you for listening today, and um, I'll turn it back over to you. You know, thank you, Dr. Clark. You know, what I took away from what you just said is that there's really a lot of things that we can do to help protect our for our healthy older population. And in fact, there's a lot of things that we're doing that are, in, are detrimental to them. I, I just find that fascinating. You know, we've been told that there's nothing you can do, uh, shelter in place, and in fact, that's exactly the wrong thing to do for our healthy elderly. You know, I've got older parents who had made the decision not to leave their home since March. And one of the things I'll attest to is, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult to live two people in a home <laughs> for months, right? You know, you start getting into maybe some interpersonal conflicts. <laughs> so I'm going to emphasize to them that they, they do, as you say, which is to socialize and, and go out and then also check all their, you know, their levels. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe we're now going to hear from, there might be a little change in the order. All right. Shortly, we are going to, catch up with Dr. Armstrong, who's going to talk to us about how we should handle our frail elderly. We're just going to put that off for a moment. We're going to switch over to talking about really everybody else in society, not so much the young, not so much the old, but really everybody else, right? And the effects of the lockdown, how it's impacted society, business, life, all of that. My colleague, Dr. Erickson. I got plenty of time. Okay, good. All right. Well, um, yeah, excited to be here. I'm from California. A lot of us from California right now. And uh, I met Simone, uh, interestingly enough. She found me. I had done a little, little bit of a press release back in, oh, this is early April. And uh, kind of just gave a raw data dump. And uh, people liked it and didn't like it, as you can imagine. It wasn't biostatistically analyzed, it was basic raw data that I said, okay, this is what I found. We had done 5,000 tests, 6.5% positive, and I was just dumping raw data. I wasn't saying, you know, all of society. I was just giving my opinion on it, because I, I had seen so much uh, fear, and uh, patients were saying, you know, what, what do we believe, what do we not believe? The, the media was asking us, you know, can you give us some feedback on what you're seeing? Because I have several we have clinics all throughout California. So they said, can you give us some semblance of, you know, should we be terrified? Should we be staying in our homes? And I said, well, the disease I'm seeing is mild. I said, we're seeing thousands of patients with some congestion, cough. We follow them for two weeks. They get better with no treatment, and they go right back to work. And they said, well, that's not what we're seeing in the media. I said, well, I'm on the front lines, the front line doctors. We're seeing these, and this is what we're seeing. This is not hyperbole. This isn't what I think. This is what we're seeing. Young and old, we're seeing them do quite well. They're going back to work. They're going back to school. They're not staying at home. They're not terribly ill. So I, I felt like I had to do some type of a press release. So my press release was supposed to be a, a five-minute nightly news thing, and they told me about something called Facebook Live. And that baby went everywhere. And so I, what the, the main advantage of it was I got to talk to doctors from all over the country. And I said, hey, Ohio, New York, what are you guys seeing? ER doctors, what are you seeing? And they said, well, we're seeing what you're seeing. They said, except patients aren't coming in. And I said, well, you know, explain that to me. They said, well, it was a, it was a, it was a Saturday. He said, I, a guy with chest pain on Tuesday didn't come in till Saturday. He had had a mild heart attack had some damage, didn't come in because he was afraid of COVID. Next patient, abdominal pain, 
uh, diverticulitis that had perforated. Well, why didn't you come in a week ago? I was afraid of COVID. So they're afraid of the COVID, so the care they should have received is delayed. And so I, I felt the, the responsibility to get out there and start talking about this, get a dialogue going with those of us that are actually seeing patients, you know, not media types. So uh, that's, anyway, that's, the, that's the, a, long, a long introduction. But Dr. Gold, uh, that's how I met her. She found me and we kind of, you know, felt this bond over needing to do something. You know, we love this country. Dr. Gold, if you know her at all, she is passionate about the country about our constitution, about our rights, about our amendments. She's a fireball on these topics and she's the reason we're all, she's kind of like the, the center of the, the wheel. She's the reason why we're here. So I, I've enjoyed getting to know her over the last three months. Uh, she inspires, she has inspired me to, to speak out more. And, uh, and I, I kind of wanted to say one thing before I get started is that, you know, before I took a Hippocratic oath, I took a pledge. Um, I pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't know if you guys took that pledge, but most of us in school put our hand over our heart and did that daily. And we faced the flag, and our teachers faced the flag. We didn't burn it. We didn't stomp on it. We faced it, and we respected it. And that's the background I believe we're all coming from, is respect for country, respect for flag. Allegiance, I pledge loyalty, I pledge commitment to the flag that represents our 50 states. I pledge to help keep it together and unite the people to the republic for which it stands. What's a republic? It's a, a state in which the supreme power rests with the people and our elected officials. You know, the republic for which it stands. Our republic right now is being attacked. COVID is just a vehicle to attack the republic. As I, I walk around DC and I see empty streets, I see a hotel that's 8% occupied. That's a tragedy. That's the republic under attack. Make no mistake, that's not COVID. That's the republic under attack. When I see hospitals, I call the CEOs I, this week. I said, how's it going? What percent of your hospital is COVID? 15. So 85, 90% of the health care is things like cardiac disease, diabetes, you know, all kinds of fractures. We've forgotten that the medical system is this huge thing. We're all COVID crazy all about COVID, and we focused on the one thing to the detriment of others. So anyway, that's just kind of an introduction of where, how I met her, where we're coming from. We love, I think we all love this country in this room, and we're here to try and get the republic back on its feet. Uh, a couple things, our early testing, we have eight medical centers throughout the state of California. Our early testing showed about 6.5% positivity. We've done 5,000 tests. To date, we've done 26,893 tests. These are your PCR nasal swabs. So we're, we're, we keep three labs busy. I don't know if you guys are doing this testing, but the fear has driven massive traffic. We had a June like I've never seen. I, I went to one of our centers and I thought it was the DMV. <laughs> packed in, people around the building. I was like looking for free puppies and hot dogs. I thought, what, what, what is going on? No, it's fear. As we've heard from most of our esteemed people today, driving that. So um, our, our test to date right now, uh, most currently as of last week, were 14.9% positive PCR for 26,893 tests. Again, most people very, uh, very mild illness. And what I was noticing on the media is that they were saying, Cases, 5,000 new cases in Houston. Okay, a case is a person healthy that tested positive, the vast majority. But the public hears cases and thinks, oh my goodness, these are sick people. No, the vast majority, 99.8% of people get through this with little to no progressive or significant disease. But the cases, every day, all the major media, the cases, the cases, the cases. That is not what we should be talking about. Hospitalizations, that's fair. D deaths that are appropriately coded on a death certificate, that's fair. And I, I stress appropriately coded. Um, our testing has been taking about seven to 10 days. And this has been the challenge where you're telling people to isolate for 10 to 14 and you're, they're getting their test results right at the end of their sort of quarantine. 
So I don't know what you guys think of quarantine. Uh, from the very beginning, I've questioned quarantine. The word quarantine. We quarantine those that have had a significant exposure to something. Those are at significant risk. And this is the first time uh, I've seen quarantining healthy. I don't know if you guys think that's normal. I find that very strange. Um, initially, my family, uh, when we first started out in March, we were wearing masks, we were buying Lysol, we were doing the whole thing, right? And uh, then after a couple of months, when I said, now wait a second, the cases I'm seeing are extremely mild. I called the CEOs from three different centers in Central California, I said, how are you guys doing? Slow. I said, like how slow? 40% occupancy, whoa. And they had all their, the tents are out, we're ready for bear, and squirrel shows up. We were ready, right? We were, we were going for the big ones. We were all ready because we had heard, we'd watched China, we'd watched the different nations and said, let's get ready for this, which I agree with, 100%. Let's get fully ready, but then let's be realistic with the response. Who showed up? Most of the patients that were showing up for me were very mild illness. So at that point, we need to make sure, that's why I, I wanted to come out and sort of give reality to the situation on the ground. And, and sort of help dispel some fear that people have had. Um, what else here? The academic models, I forgot to mention those. I, I'm sure you guys heard the early academic models. Two and a half million cases. Some of the predictions out of Europe made their way over here. That caused pandemonium. Oh my goodness, millions of cases. And our, our leaders, uh, unmentioned named leaders, were, were telling us this. And that created some fear amongst physicians in my practice. We have about 50 people in my practice. That caused some fear, because our leaders were tell early, early on now. And so as I had done so much testing, I, I felt the need to come out and sort of talk about what I was seeing, and not just what I was hearing on the media, which was the opposite of what I was, was seeing. Uh, Simone asked me to talk about lockdowns, because it's, it's an interest of mine. I've sort of studied the globe a little bit to see, are, were we the best, uh, was our ideology the best? Did we produce a good result uh, from the lockdowns? I don't, I don't know if you guys thought we did, but when you, when you take on a $21 trillion economy, maybe I'm crazy, I think you need science and data. So I, I looked around the world to different people and I said, what is the science and data of social distancing, locking us down, where's the science for that? and it was crickets. And I looked for it, maybe you guys found it, I couldn't find it. And I heard from the epidemiologists globally that it's not about science, it's about how, how you wanna handle this as a community. And we handled it based on what we thought was the best maneuver, which was kind of to shut down an economy. But I thought, there's gonna be so much collateral damage to this. When you're taking a massive economy, which we've never done, the United States, if you study GDP, is the largest economy in the world. There's not a close second, right? And so if you're gonna experiment with that, you, you better know you're gonna be right. And I don't think we knew that. And so we moved forward shutting down the economy. What do we hope to accomplish? They said, we're gonna flatten this curve. And I asked Dr. Vitowski, uh, who's a biostatistician, I asked several epidemiologists, what do you think of this whole flattening curve? where we, instead of spiking up, spiking down, getting through it, i.e. China, if you look at the graphs of how they went and getting through it, let's, let's go ahead and slow the spread. Let's, let's spread people out, let's mask them up, and let's slow this thing down. Did you guys think that was a good idea? I, I'm asking you guys, did you, did you guys think it was a good idea? I mean, does anybody think that's a good idea? It seems like a good idea at the beginning. It sounds good to protect the hospitals. So at some point we thought, okay, we see, we see uh, Italy, we see Spain, 600 deaths per million, all these people flowing in. Was the footage all realistic? We can debate that, right? But I, I think the key thing is that um, we didn't really know what it was gonna, if flattening the curve was gonna work for the hospital. So after we did that, we said, let's spread people out, fine. I did the same thing, mask at home, lights all everywhere, we're cleaning, we're slowing it down. Now the hospitals are dead. And my brother-in-law, orthopedic surgeon, calls me and he goes, um, they just told me I'm non-essential. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I had a hip scheduled Tuesday and they told me I can't do it or else I'll lose my license. Wow, Texas, what is going on? So <laughs> he, he, had to, he did one case, um, into the, into the whole COVID crisis, and now he's being reviewed by the medical board. 
an orthopedic surgeon for replacing a hip so someone could walk and not get a pulmonary embolism. Does anybody think that's non-essential? So this, this, is, this is some of the craziness, and, and I, I, uh, I had to speak out about it. Um, was the lockdown successful? I say yes, very successful. Successful in things like this. Anxiety hotline calls up 1,000%. Child abuse, both sexual and non, up. Uh, financial, emotional distress, suicide, alcohol, 150,000 Americans a month not receiving cancer screening. It's been effective, all right, in all the wrong metrics, in all the areas we didn't want it to be effective. Uh, delayed in medical care, we talked about that. Uh, orthopedics non-essential, suicide calls up 600% suicide calls. And we've heard other doctors mention this. So was the lockdown effective? If, if that's what the effect you were going for, then yes, but it, it was trying to flatten the curve, but it had these, these secondary consequences that I think are devastating. Uh, people staying indoors, no exercising, as you mentioned, no vitamin D. Uh, people, <laughs> I'm watching people in their Prius by themselves driving with a mask on. I mean, this stuff is, you know, there's no sense to it. It's fear, as one of the doctors pointed out. Uh, oh, uh, one other interesting thing I found is staffing. I don't know if you guys had this problem. My staff was getting afraid. They didn't want to come in. So we'd have six or seven people call off. We had one clinic that was doing all the testing. And they said, I don't want to be around the COVID. So our staff wouldn't come in. Now we couldn't see the patients, couldn't process. And if you know, if you guys did the, uh, the public health reporting is a little bit onerous, right? It's, I don't know if you guys saw all the paperwork for this thing. It's a lot. I, I hired 20 some people to just do paperwork and talk to the public health department because you have to report every single case. So it was very, uh, it was very labor intensive. And what's interesting is uh, I called the hospitals last week. I said, are you at capacity? And they said, well, we're at capacity for the staff we can get. We're not at capacity for the building. We only have certain ICU nurses, which we're paying triple what we normally pay, 130 some an hour for an ICU nurse, because there wasn't staff, because of fear. They didn't want to come in. They didn't, they didn't want to be around that deadly virus. You, you see how that perception has caused outflow into society? It's affected the hospitals. It's affected all of us. That fear is critical. I appreciate, I forgot the doctor earlier, the child psychologist. What, a, what an eloquent fear discussion he had. Perfect, perfect. First pandemic in the world, by the way, where we had social media, cameras, phones to share. Panic can go around the world. Quick. If this happened in the in the eighties, you know, we'd see it in the paper. You might you might turn on Ted Koppel, but you, now you got on your phone live feeds from China. So the, I think all this, all this together, sort of whipped up this global frenzy um, to where we could see things in real time as it was happening. We thought, well, that's not going to happen to us. We're going to lock down. We're going to stop this thing. Did it work? Did it slow the spread? We'll go over that in a little bit. Um, what else? Financial aspects of the lockdown. California is at 16.3% unemployment. That's terrible. What does that compare to? A uh, Great Depression, recession, whatever you call it, 2008 to 2010, we hit 12.3. This is worse than that. So unbelievable. Uh, $56 billion shortfall this year in California. $56 billion. And you know what our, our leadership and all their wisdom decides to do? Why don't we cut the funding for Medi-Cal? Prop 56 is, as you guys know, is a smoker's excise tax, $1.2 billion. It comes to people like me. I build centers in underserved areas so that the people, which is one in three people in California, they can get coverage. They can, they can get care in their neighborhood. They don't have to drive a half an hour. So by, by getting rid of that, that uh, pool of money, it's $1.2 billion. It's a smoker's tax for doctors to care for Medi-Cal. To take that care away from Medi-Cal and essentially slap our underserved with decreased health care to me is criminal. And, and I watch these decisions because um, I, I talk to some of the congressmen. They say, can you believe we're voting on whether or not we should give medical care to our underserved Medi-Cal population, which is one in three in California? Can you believe this is happening? Because of a shortfall, because our hotel over here is 8% occupied. The taxes aren't flowing in D.C. or California. You, you can't do this, is what I'm saying, and not have significant medical you know, collateral damage. I'm going to suggest the collateral damage is far worse than COVID. 
when you look at all the all factors combined, the delayed care, the uh, Medi-Cal not getting served, it's, it, you don't have to be a PhD in economics to understand this is not good from a, a fiscal or a medical perspective. Okay, um, 20 million Americans are still have lost their jobs. 40 million initially, we still have 20 million out of work. So these lockdowns have caused, and that, you know, we can go on for another 10 minutes on what that causes in society. And I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up Sweden. Um, I've been studying Sweden, watching them for four months now. Dr. Anders Tegnell, Dr. Johan Gosecki, um, they have sort of taken a different approach. Uh, I don't know if you guys have followed Sweden at all, but it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating because they trust their people. They said, you know, uh, we have a pandemic here. We know kids don't transfer it to adults. Let's keep the kids in schools, kids under 16. You know, uh, I, think, I think you would like, Dr. Hamilton would like the Swedish model. Kids under 16, all in school. Great, perfect. They didn't shut them down. Restaurants open. They told the citizens, hey, why don't you spread out a little bit? Uh, do what you do, and they listen to their government, they have a trusting relationship, and they're 460 uh, deaths per million. UK is part of the 600 club, 600 deaths per million. Spain, 600 deaths per, per million. They're all in the 600 range, total lockdown. Sweden is at 560, no lockdown. And then people say, okay, what about its Nordic neighbor? Has way less death. Right, so Norway has half the population, has much smaller uh, nursing homes, much less death. The, 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 I would say the mistake Sweden made was they didn't protect their elderly. They had these large elderly homes. They didn't protect their elderly. And Anders Tegna will tell you that. He's their chief epidemiologist, brilliant guy. He's very content with their results, but he said one thing when pressed, what would I do different? He said, I would have protected our elderly. We didn't do that. And there's, there's multiple accounts of nurses and paramedics who said, we actually were keeping the elderly in their home. We didn't want to take them to the hospitals and infect the hospital. That caused some death. Delayed care, as you guys know, COVID is an early disease treatment. You gotta treat that puppy early. And if you wait, you start getting the respiratory, you start getting the inflammation, all that starts happening. Well, that's kind of the method they took. So that's one thing they would have done different. What I like about um, Sweden's model is it's sustainable. They said, listen, we can go on like this for years. You guys are in an unsustainable economic financial lockdown that cannot work. We are in a model we can go on for years. I think that's critical, a sustainable model that you can use when a pandemic comes. Because guess what? We're going to have corona and flu next year. Are we going to do this again? I, I pray not. I, I, I hope we can look at other countries and, and not be arrogant and say, I think they had a good result. Their, their kids are in school. Their shopping centers are open. Their restaurants are open. They're doing well. And they, they pulled back a little bit. You know, if, if, if 100 is the goal, they might, might have pulled back to 70. They didn't pull back to 10. We pulled it way down to an unsustainable level. Um, let's see here. Uh, I want to talk about uh, death totals. I had written this down. In 1993, 97,000 Swedes died in total. This is one of the more deadly years. So what, is that, what does that look like monthly? Well, in December 1993, they had 11,000 deaths. This is a bad year. In April 2020, Sweden had 10,058 deaths. So this COVID pandemic coming through is not as bad as the year they had in 1993. So I, I always put everything in perspective when someone gives me a number, I go, what's, what's normal for that country? Is that, is that high? Is that low? It turns out that's on the higher end. Um, and we talked about the world deaths, the 600 club, UK, Spain, and Italy, all in the 600 range. UA, USA is at 448. Um, Sweden's at 564. These are deaths per million. So those numbers are just to show us that lockdown didn't produce a significant decrease in the death rate. Flattened the curve, didn't change the death rate that much. So I would say that locking down isn't a significant protective measure for deaths. And because we had, we had pockets that were overwhelmed, New York, New Jersey, I understand that. But in, in states like California, where I'm from, we absolutely weren't overwhelmed. We were underwhelmed to the point where hospital CEOs said, if we didn't have a massive chain of 10 hospitals, we would be closing our doors for good. So I don't think that's the right approach. Um, right now in Sweden, they have about 25% immunity. So an, another uh, benefit you get from people mingling is immunity. Is it herd immunity? No. That usually comes, per my epidemiologist, biostatistic friends, is usually 70% or greater. To where the young and healthy get the disease, 
and then it, the virus pretty soon runs out of places to go and kind of dies out. Sweden is on their way. Well, if you look at Norway, it's one to two percent. So you say to yourself, okay, non-lockdown, we got higher immunity, the economy's intact, you have some more deaths, which, you know, uh, Norway may have later. As their people are not immune, they go into a cold and flu, no immunity, no protection, the disease goes. So I, I think Sweden's approach is better from that perspective. Uh, let's see here. So solutions. One of the solutions that I think we should talk about is uh, physician committees. I think having a, a group like this who advises our, our president and our leaders to say, this is what we're seeing. We're not, we're not, we're not theory people. We're not academic, I, I'm not using academic models. I assume most of you are using real, real world experience. I think people like us should have a little bit of say to say, this is what we're seeing. Why don't we take a rational approach? Why don't we have many, many wise counselors? Instead of kind of a single, maybe research-oriented person, why don't we get real-world people on the ground to give our input? And I think Dr. Gold has been, done a great job assembling you guys. Uh, measures in place to not shut down the economy, but take a sustainable approach. So I think Sweden, we have something to learn from them, as does the World Health Organization, as you guys know, said we need to learn some things from Sweden. So I think those two things are critical, just to kind of finish up, is that we listen to our physicians on the front lines, we put measures in place to not lock down, and we, do a, we have a sustainable approach so that when we approach these pandemics, we're not merely struck by fear and confusion and academic modeling, we take an organized approach, we back down things a little bit, and we have a sustainable model to move through the next cold and flu season. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, you brought up so many issues I just want to touch on before we turn to our next speaker. Um, no particular order, just different things you had said that the European model, the case fatality rate is in the 600s, United States is in the 400s, and Sweden's in the 500s. So I can't wait to share with you later on this afternoon how these numbers are orders of magnitudes greater than countries that have free and easy access to a cheap, cheap, safe, generic drug. It's kind of crazy when you look at the numbers, so I hope everyone stays tuned for that and remembers those numbers. Um, another thing, you know, we're talking about a lockdown, and it's interesting, you know, I come to this problem as an emergency physician, and my goodness, you know, the, the hospitals were empty. I, again, I wasn't in New York when this happened. I did do my training in New York, so I had a lot of friends in New York, and there's no question they were overwhelmed about a three to four week period, it was really tough. Were they overwhelmed in terms of the reasons we, we were addressing in terms of, quote, flattening the curve? No, as everybody knows, there were plenty of ventilators for everybody, there was the big ship, there was the Javits Center, which remained empty. But for the day-to-day -day practice as an ER doctor, had I been in New York at that time, according to my friends, you know, it was very tough and difficult. That period lasted three to four weeks, but they got through it. It was not a situation where Anybody who needed treatment didn't get treatment. People got treatment. No one was turned away because they, they couldn't take it. So it was just above capacity, but like, a, you know, I, I don't want to make up numbers, but a little bit above capacity, but the system was able to absorb it. And that's really the personal uh, doctors and nurses. They had plenty of um, physical uh, ability to take care of the patients in terms of ventilators and hospital beds. You might remember that the Javits Center was almost completely empty. So we have to remember that the whole purpose of locking down was not to overwhelm our healthcare system. Okay, we cannot forget that. We cannot just keep changing the definition and keep moving the goal, the goal post. We are not overwhelming the healthcare system. There were many months that myself as an ER physician and cardiologist and neurologist, we, we were at half I mean, my, my workflow is 50%. It was fabulous. I go to work and I'd see not even half the numbers of patients I normally did. This has never happened in my career as an ER doctor. I mean, if there's one thing that you have as an ER doctor is that you're busy all the time. I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't drink so you don't have to go to the bathroom, right? So here I was, you know, I've seen maybe, not even half, maybe we're at 40%. Um, American College of Cardiology, they put out a paper that about 40% of strokes and heart attack-like or chest pain situations were, were just absent. The same thing for strokes. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, as part of the American Frontline Doctors, is the chair of neurosurgery uh, over at USC, and he said he, see, he sees 
He was seeing less than half the numbers of people he would otherwise help who have a special kind of thing, an aneurysm in the brain that would cause, ble cause bleeding and cause a stroke, and he was seeing less than half. Where are all those patients? Where are they? Are they labeled COVID deaths? You know, may, right? I mean, those are casualties of COVID, but they're not, they're not the virus. They're not the virus. So the death effects of the lockdown are extreme. I wrote a letter to the president many, several months ago. That's how this whole thing started. Causing the lockdown a mass casualty incident. I did not call the virus a mass casualty incident. It's the lockdown. And one of the first things I said in one of the very first interviews I gave was that more people were being harmed by the lockdown and dying from the lockdown than the virus. And until people listened to us, the frontline doctors, they thought that was crazy talk. It's not even close to crazy. The numbers of people that have been harmed or killed due to the effects of the lockdown and the subsequent financial, it's not a dirty word to say financial. If people don't have money, they end up less healthy. That's why people come to America, not to really get money, but to have better lives, including physical, healthier lives. The suicide calls gone up, child abuse, et cetera. In all ways, the lockdown is a problem. The strokes that went missing, the, anyway, the list is endless. The problem now is the lockdown, and more importantly, the problem is the fear which Dr. McDonald eloquently addressed. It's not the virus. We doctors here are here to tell you that there are treatments, especially if you get it early. You need to think of COVID-19 as two different diseases. There's an early disease and there's a late disease. For a doctor, they're completely different. The early disease is all about viral replication. Does the virus get into the cell? And when it gets into the cell, does it reproduce a lot? Once it does that, if you have that situation, the cell then bursts, the virus goes out and infects all the other cells. That's a viral replication disease. Much, much later, if you haven't treated it or your body hasn't healed it, which, as we've heard, young people heal it, people without comorbid conditions heal it. But if you don't have that situation and you go into the, really, the second disease, it's nothing, that's not the problem. The second disease is cytokine storm, which is massive inflammation. When you get that terrible inflammation all over your body, especially your lungs, you really are in jeopardy. We also have medicines for that. But we'd like to have you not get to that second disease. We're here to tell you that there's a lot that you can do to not be in that situation. I also want to say that there are perhaps situations where society should decide to lock down, right? If you had a situation such as smallpox, that comes to mind. Highly contagious, lethal, thankfully not an issue. This is not that. COVID-19 is either asymptomatic or mildly ill for the majority of the population. When they go back and they do antibody testing, which is people who've been exposed, people are very stunned by the numbers. We're talking environments have 20% or 40% that have already been exposed. In New York City, a hotbed area, one area of the Bronx, 43% of the people had antibodies already. The vast majority of them never knew they had been exposed, never had symptoms, or if they did, they were so trivial they didn't remember. The point is, most people who get this virus do just fine. There's a small, there's a, a, a minority that do get sick. I certainly see them. All, there's no doctor here who's going to tell you this isn't a real illness for some people. I see it in the emergency department. Patients come in, and if they're in that kind of between the first disease and maybe going to move on to the second part of the disease, in that range, you get, you're sick, right? You've got a fever, you're coughing, you've got chest pain, or you're uncomfortable, it's hard to breathe. We also have treatment in that stage, which we'll get to this afternoon. But the vast, a small subject, subsect of that group could go on to get critically ill. But overall, the numbers are very small. This is not a reason to lock down. When this whole thing is over, you have to decide if you want to be living in a free society or not a free society. There are times when you should give up your, your civil liberties. Going to work, that's part of our rights as free human beings. We don't just give that up for something that doesn't harm most people most of the time. I'm going to turn it over now. I, I'm not certain if... Do, 
if Luke can hear me, if Dr. Armstrong is on, wonderful. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to, you know, I just want to say to all of our viewers out there that we are frontline doctors. We're not media people. We're not famous celebrity doctors. <laughs> so please bear with us. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Armstrong, who will talk to us about the best way to handle or the best way to manage our frail elderly population. Hello, good morning. Thanks for having me today. Um, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you all for everything that you do uh, in taking care of patients in this COVID-19 pandemic. It is just amazing to, to work with, with, with physicians like yourselves. So on, on April the 2nd, we were confronted with, with, uh, with an emergency situation. Uh, we had 86 of our residents at a nursing home in South Texas test positive for COVID-19, where there were 86 people, 31 staff and 55 residents. And so this was a, a, a pretty catastrophic situation uh, for us. Uh, we, had, we were just coming off of, of, of uh, uh, what we saw in Washington State, where, where they had you know, a large number of residents die. Uh, we were seeing devastating situations in Louisiana in nursing facilities. And so we decided we could do in Tennessee, they just unloaded the nursing home and sent all of the patients to, um, to, to the hospital, which was devastating for them as well. So we decided our team, you know, we decided we're gonna take care of these patients in, in the nursing facility, and we're gonna do it with the medications that seem to have had some success in, in China and in France. And so we use hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and zinc. And so we decided we went, and, and of course these are um, COVID-19 patients, and so we, we purchased PPE uh, from our own um, um, company's money, and, and we decided that we were gonna staff that facility for two weeks, like, like, like an inpatient hospital almost. We had two physicians there every day, we had a support nurse there every day, and we had a nurse practitioner there every day. And so we decided to do something that was pretty novel and, 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 and to our um, um, surprise had not been done before. And so we, we treated the patients in the nursing facility with those medications. We monitored them, um, we, we monitored their oxygen saturations. And what we were finding was that for elderly people, when they drop their oxygen saturation from, from where it normally is, that's when they're about to crash. And even if they look good, they could have normal oxygen saturations, but 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 still, or, or actually abnormal oxygen saturations, but still look very comfortable and seem like they were doing well. And so, what we decided to do was monitor their oxygen saturations. We monitored their temperatures. Uh, we had the owner in the facility there working, and we were putting in many many hours trying to monitor them very closely. So when they dropped their oxygen saturation um, below ninety five percent then we started them on the medication because we had had a lot of experience um, taking care of them. And we had watched some people from the previous week actually go to the hospital when at that time we didn't know what was going on. Uh, we had also had previous experience as well as a hospital physician, as a hospitalist. We had taken care of patients in the hospital and treated them with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. We had had good results from that. And so we decided to do this in the nursing home. And so we started to follow them, follow them very closely, monitor their oxygen saturation. We ended up not treating all of them because not all of them had symptoms. So when they'd spike a fever or, or when they would um, drop their oxygen saturation, we would start, start them on the three drug regimen of hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and zinc. And so we knew these medications were safe. We had used them long before and so we, many times before, and so we knew that, that there was little side effect. Now, when we treated them, um, we did EKGs on day three, some of the patients on day four of the treatment, it's only a five day uh, treatment regimen. And so we did EKGs and we saw zero QTC prol prolongation. And, and that's the, the, the y'all were all physicians, so you know that's, that's what predisposes them to having the cardiac arrhythmias, which is what the media says. So I, I actually had, them, had those EKGs read by a cardiologist and it was really funny because what he asked me, he said, you know, I don't even know why you're doing EKGs on these patients. They, they don't need them. You know, um, he said that, that in their 
combined 50 years of practice, they've seen cardiac arrhythmias with a prolonged QTC interval at three times. And so it, it almost never happens. And of course, you know, any, any medication that's in the drug cabinet is actually going to, um, you know, is going to have a, a, a side effect of a prolonged QTC interval. And so we treated these patients for that five-day regimen. On day one, we gave them 400 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine twice a day on day one. On days two through five, we gave them 200 milligrams twice a day. Um, we gave them just a regular z pack 500 milligrams on day one, 250 milligrams daily, days two through five. And then we gave them 220 milligrams of zinc daily because that's what we had in the nursing facility. And so uh, we treated them. And what we found was 37 out of 38 patients that we treated actually were cured from COVID-19. They recovered from COVID-19. Uh, we had um, two that died later from unknown causes. They had been very, very ill patients. And so today, 35 out of 38 of these very elderly, frail patients, and of course, these are the sickest patients of the sick. These are the folks who have, they all have coronary artery disease. They all have congestive heart failure. They all have chronic medical problems. They're all chronically debilitated. And they tolerated the medications very well. We had no QTC prolongation. We had no side effects from the hydroxychloroquine in any way. And so this was a success story. And, and you would have thought that, that, that the media would have, would have, would have uh, uh, celebrated it as such, but, but certainly they did not. You know, the governor of the state of Texas actually knew what we were doing, was on the phone with me. Um, the lieutenant governor knew because he had helped me get the medications that we needed. And, and so we had the, the health department knew about it. But, but it's amazing to me the, the negative response we've gotten from, from the national press. It's been, it's been pretty, pretty, pretty um, very disappointing. Uh, the Texas Medical Board, medical boards all over the United States have been a hindrance uh, to treating patients. The Food and Drug Administration with their emergency use authorization and then they take it back and then they put restrictions on it have been a hindrance to treating patients. I believe that the Food and Drug Administration and the medical boards in the United States of America have been um, have been responsible for the deaths of many people, uh, many elderly people for sure, and, and many Americans for sure, because they have been uh, withholding this treatment and putting restrictions on this treatment with hydroxychloroquine. Um, certainly, um, the, the media has played a big role in this, and politics have played a role in this. And that is extremely unfortunate, but we saw great success in our nursing facility. And we, the families are happy, the patients are happy, but, but unfortunately the, the media and, 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 and the press and the, the medical boards and, and the, the bureaucrats are, are, are unhappy. And so, and I, I certainly plan on taking this fight to them, um, certainly in the future. Um, I've got my own battles going forward. But, but, but we're going to certainly win. I certainly am a strong proponent of hydroxychloroquine being over the counter because it is a safe medication. I've actually taken it myself when I went to Africa, you know, and I bought it off the shelf of, of a store in, in Nairobi, Kenya when I was there. And I took 200 milligrams daily the whole time I was there. And so, and so it's, it's a very safe medication. I believe that the way we treated these nursing home patients, the most sick and the most frail and the most vulnerable as well, the way we treated them should be the standard of care for treatment in all nursing homes in the United States of America. That is, I firmly believe that. I believe that we would have saved thousands and thousands of lives, but we could not get that message out because the media was on the constant attack the entire time. And so it should be the standard of care the way we treated them. We had great success, and, and I am just, um, it frustrates me because I believe thousands of Americans, tens of thousands of Americans have died unnecessarily. Um, I believe that there is a treatment that is available. I believe that there is lots that we can do as a medical community to push this forward. I think in a lot of ways, the medical community has not been forceful enough that's why I appreciate uh, Dr. Gold and, and everything that she's doing to press this forward. 
And so it is so important that we do this. So thank you that I believe we're doing the Lord's work. I believe that it is vital and important to, um, to, to pushing, moving the ball forward, you know, getting past this COVID-19 pandemic, opening up our, 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 our schools and opening up our society and opening up our businesses. I believe it's vitally important. But, but also, I think it's important that we protect our most vulnerable. There is a way to do that. You know, we have shown that it is successful. And, and I believe that we should certainly, uh, this should be allowed to proceed forward. So thank you very much. And, and, and God bless you. And um, if there's any questions at all, I'm not sure what's next. Dr. Armstrong, please don't hang up, okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. 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 I just want to say a couple of things. And then I actually have a couple, have a couple of questions, questions for you, Dr. Armstrong. 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 Is, is the echo resolved? Okay. Um, first of all, you know, a lot of what you said is going to come as tremendous, shocking news to most of the listeners and viewers out there. Because you said that you gave all your most frail people, let me back up for a moment. When you go to the uh, cdc.gov site, it lists by age the people who've died from COVID. Overwhelmingly, the numbers correlate to age, but more than age, it's the comorbid condition. So you can be very elderly, and if you're healthy, you should come out of this okay. But if you're older, very, on the really the extreme elderly, let's say over 85, over 80, plus comorbid conditions, your chances of dying if you get this are actually pretty substantial. And what you said was incredibly dramatic, that you, that's the group that you're taking care of. And they overwhelmingly did not die and did well. Is that correct? That is correct. They did very well. We really, we really, we, we, is there anything we can do about the echo? We really need to emphasize that. Thank you so much. Sort of. I'm not sure you want to hear me once. I definitely don't think you want to hear me twice. Okay. So we really need to emphasize that to everybody who's listening and watching, that the most frail elderly, the group that has mortality, 40%, 50%, should they come down with COVID-19, had a, a fraction of that percent when they were treated with hydroxychloroquine. Dr. Armstrong, I'm going to come back to you for a question, and we'd like to know what actually happened to you when you did this. So I'm going to come back to you in a moment. But before we do that, the negative press about hydroxychloroquine has really been quite stunning. Um, you know, before it became politicized, I was excited about it. You know, I knew about this since maybe February, I think, or maybe even January, but certainly long before President Trump ever said anything about it, I knew that hydroxychloroquine looked like a very good treatment for this. So I remember watching the coronavirus task force at the time that the president mentioned that he, I think his exact words were, I, I happen to feel good about it. It's kind of interesting because he said something positive about remdesivir at that same conference, but everybody just jumped all over the hydroxychloroquine. Um, I thought there was just going to be a shortage of, of the medicine. <laughs> you know, everyone was going to go out and buy it immediately. Um, but instead, the next day, it was almost like the media um, just like threw up all over hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. They just they just discredited it so badly, and it was I think for everybody in this room and everybody at home, it, you know, it was it, doctors at home. It was it was really quite mysterious. I mean, it just, this was a drug that's completely not controversial. It's actually sold in the vitamin section of the stores in, across the world. I mean, it just didn't really, we couldn't wrap our heads around this. Um, and then we kept hearing about the quote unquote safety issue of it. Well, we have to understand, right? The only two things you need to know about a drug is, is it safe and is it effective? We're going to get into hydroxychloroquine more later, but I just want to do a little, a little overview of it. Is a drug safe? Right? I'll get to efficacy in a minute. It almost doesn't matter if something works. We sell lots and lots of things that don't work. Right? That's capitalism. You can buy whatever you like here. The question is, is it safe? The government has an obligation to make sure things that are being sold is not safe. I mean, they have an obligation in America. That's the kind of society we want to live in. So every time somebody came to me, especially doctors, with some, some purported safety uh, claim, I knew that they'd already drunk the Kool-Aid. Because there's no safety issue whatsoever. I mean... There's a safety issue just you know, from opening your eyes and going outside and getting into a car. That's got a safety issue as well. But we don't talk about that. So when I say that there's no safety issue, what I mean is there's no safety issue above the baseline risk of going out every day and living your life. In that baseline risk of living, chloroquine, and more importantly, what we have in America, hydroxychloroquine, is considered exceedingly safe. 
it's safer certainly than many over-the-counter medications like Tylenol, aspirin, and Motrin. The number one reason by, why human beings in America get a liver transplant is Tylenol toxicity. Chloroquine is much safer than that. I, I sometimes use the terms chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine interchangeably. Hydroxychloroquine is a more modern version of, of chloroquine, um, and it's an even safer, even though they both are very safe. The issue that we hear a lot about, this purported heart issue, relates to something called the QT interval. The QT interval is a part of your EKG finding. Many, many drugs prolong the QT interval. If it prolongs the QT interval very severely, you can run into trouble. How many drugs prolong the QT interval? I don't even have time to discuss it. There are hundreds. It's just a very well-known side effect of many medications. Is it a real issue? Well, it's true that some medicines, including hydroxychloroquine, can prolong it. But the question is, does it prolong it enough to get into some kind of jeopardy situation? The people who get a prolonged QT interval tend to have heart disease and tend to maybe be on other medications that also prolong it. That's what you need to know. Now that we're many, many months into this issue, we actually have a study that's directly on point about the QT interval, hydroxychloroquine, in the era of COVID. As I said to you initially, many drugs prolong the QT interval. The two drugs that are used together to treat COVID when it's more serious is hydroxychloroquine plus zinc. Zinc is a huge part of it. And azithromycin. Both of those drugs, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, can prolong the QT interval. So the question that people are throwing up in terms of safety is, well, if they both can prolong the QT interval, maybe if you take them together, it'll prolong it enough that it's really a problem. Well, interestingly enough, we have an answer to that exact question, which I'll read to you now. From the American Heart Association, April 20th, 2020, in an article entitled, uh, actually, I don't have pardon me, I don't have the title of the article right now, but they were studying the duration of the QT interval in patients who were taking hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, during COVID. And they found the following. Again, the American Heart Association. In the largest reported cohort of coronavirus disease 2019 to date treated with hydroxychloroquine, plus or minus azithromycin, no instance of fatal arrhythmias were reported. Meaning, you may prolong the QT interval some percentage of the time, but nobody had it so prolonged that it jeopardized them. And in fact, nobody even had to come off the drug for that. I spent a lot of time talking about this now because we now have an instance Dr. Armstrong is sharing with us that he had the most frail patients, probably almost all of them had heart disease. It's exactly the population you might say, no, 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 don't give hydroxychloroquine to those people, right? They might do badly. Well, the American Heart Association discovered that that's actually not true. They did just fine. And we have a physician here who just treated all of his nursing home patients with it, and they did just fine. Am I accurately stating what you think, Dr. Armstrong? Yeah, everybody, everybody did well. No one had cardiac problems at all. I okay. Mean, it, was, um, it was very well tolerated. In fact, no one had any side effects at all, none of the side effects. So they tolerated the drugs very well and did well. Okay. All right, so we're going to revisit the hydroxychloroquine issue um, later this afternoon, but we really have to yeah, emphasize, emphasize the safety, safety of, it. of it. You know, as you, another thing you had said that caught my attention, Dr. Armstrong, uh, you know, in terms of non-cardiac issues is the people in our country who prior to COVID who prescribe hydroxychloroquine the most are rheumatologists, right? They, they give it to lupus patients and rheumatoid arthritis patients. Those patients are immune compromised or elderly and they often take it for decades. And on the American College of Rheumatology website, it actually lists that in outpatient use, you don't have to do any pre-starting uh, pre the medication monitoring, meaning you don't have to get an EKG. And that's the normal state of affairs until COVID-19 hit, which is that you don't even have to get a baseline EKG if you're going to use it in outpatients. So this purported issue of QT prolongation was a non-issue until COVID-19, the politicization of the process. So Dr. Armstrong, we're going to be going into talking about medical can what I call medical cancel culture. Because a lot of people ask me, why don't more doctors speak up? I mean, there's thousands of us. We're just a few today. I know why mo I believe most doctors don't speak up, but we're going to hear from three or four doctors, hopefully you're one of them, to tell us 
Are there any reasons um, or personal things that have happened to you in terms of you not doing the same as every other physician or, or your medical societies? Were there any repercussions to you individually? Well, absolutely. So we, um, so first of all, we had, um, you know, negative articles in National Public Radio, Rolling Stone Magazine did, did a very mean article, um, you know, U.S. News and World Report, Wall Street, Wall Street Journal was positive, um, but New York Times was very negative. And so we had a lot of negative national press. You know, I've actually gotten... Um, gotten death threats, you know, some people are saying, I'm, in one group of people, I'm a, I'm a hero for treating the patients and saving them. I was a, a, a marshal on the on NASCAR, one of the, one of the marshals for NASCAR, and then on the other hand, you know, I'm Joseph Mengele, who's experimenting on old people, is what people said. And so, so I've gotten death threats for that reason, and, 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 and the Texas Medical Board is now doing an, an investigation. You know, whenever they get a complaint and whenever anything is so public as our case was, um, you know, they, they it's going to there's going to be a complaint. We all knew that this was going to take place. I, I, I knew that there was going to be some political backlash. And that's why we got the EKGs. Like I said, the cardiologist said, Robin, I don't even know why you're getting EKGs on these patients. But we knew there'd be political backlash just because I know the political climate. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, um, you know, we just we, we, we figured that the Texas Medical Board was going to do an investigation. They stay by they say by statute, if there's a complaint, then they have to do an investigation. And so that's exactly what they did. And so we're going through that now. We're going to be fine in that regard. But but I really want to I'm going I can see myself doing testimony before a Senate panel, um, a, a state Senate panel or a state House panel talking about the failures of the Texas Medical Board throughout this entire pandemic. And I'll tell you, I talked to an emergency room physician. We were talking about sending patients home with COVID-19 because our hospitals were filling up. And we said, look, you need to send these people home. I told them you need to treat them with hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin and zinc and send these folks home because they can go home if they're healthy. And the question he asked me, he says, well, Robin, is the Texas Medical Board going to come after me if I do that? You know, and, and I couldn't tell him no. You know, and so, and so physicians are afraid that they're going to lose their license. I have said many, many times, I said, physicians are, are taking it themselves when they get COVID-19. They're taking it themselves. They're prescribing it for their families when they get COVID-19, but they will not prescribe it for their patients because they're afraid to get, that they're going to get in trouble. So that's shameful that they'll take it themselves, prescribe it for their loved ones, but they will not give it to their patients because they're going to get in trouble. And that's a situation that the boards have set up, in my opinion. Thank, thank, you, know, thank you, know, thank you so thank much. You so much. Uh, uh, we're going to turn to a couple of other doctors, doctors who've had, had uh, again, medical cancel, cancel culture, culture experiences. experiences. I'm one of them. But, but before I do that, I do that uh, you reminded, reminded me to share, to share with, with our viewers. Our viewers. Uh, uh, Again, the echo. I'm sorry, the sound just went away again. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you so much. So about your point about doctors taking the medication, so there's a physician um, employment group called CERMO, and what they do is provide doctors in different situations. So their business is not about COVID or or hydroxychloroquine or anything like that, but because they have access to a lot of doctors in a database, they actually sent them a questionnaire how many were taking hydroxychloroquine, right? And it was, it was over a third. Um, the American Medical Association had to issue a letter to the physicians to please not hoard the medicine, please not to stockpile the medicine for their friends and families. Um, and in my own personal experience, I mean, I, I get tons of requests from my colleagues and doctors to, to get the medicine. I just, I just thought that was worth saying. It's, you know, it's pretty funny, I think. Um, but I'll shift into uh, just my little story about the medical cancel culture. So the first time I tried to pre prescribe hydroxychloroquine, I waited to do it until we had the rapid COVID test in my ER. Before then, I thought I should use it, but I didn't have proof that they were definitely positive, and I didn't want to get into too much difficulty at my work. So, but when we finally had the, po the rapid test uh, in the ER, you know, great, I'm like, I'm going to go prescribe it. And I understood that in my group, um, a few, I would say maybe 20% or third of the doctors were with me and maybe two thirds are on the other side. They didn't really follow the literature, but I knew it was definitely the treatment that you should give. So as I do in all the rest of my medical practice, you know, I prescribed what I knew the patient needed and that was it. I didn't really think much of it, to be honest with you. 
And then I hear about it a couple of days later from the medical director at my site, and it was such a fuss you couldn't believe it. I, I, it, you know, I, I mean, I was royally reprimanded. I, you know, we'll just say that it, it was it was unpleasant. And this is the part that's a problem: is that we doctors practice medicine as individuals, right? We do what's best for the patient in front of us by having a conversation and then giving them the pros and the cons and the benefits. And it was bizarre to me to have a colleague tell me what I should or shouldn't do. I mean, we talk collegially as, as doctors, right, amongst ourselves all the times. This wasn't that. This was you must not do that. And I thought it was really strange. I thought it was really bizarre. But there was zero chance I was not going to do what I thought was right. I mean, that's just who I am as a person. I have to do what I think is right in the world, right? That's, you know, that's not going to change. So it, this happened a few more times. And I will tell you, each time was uh, less pleasant than the first time. It was, it, was very, it was made very clear to me that if I continued to do this, there would be, you know, I wouldn't be working anymore. I wouldn't be employed. So, you know, what do you do with that information as a human being, right? That's kind of a heavy burden to bear is that you know what you need to do, but you're being told if you do that, that's actually bad for you personally. That's really difficult. Um, and I just want to say that that is part of the reason why most doctors don't speak up. It's just, it's quite difficult personally to do that. You're threatened with loss of your job, or you're threatened with sanction from your, the governor or your state medical board, which threatens your livelihood permanently, not just one particular place. Um, there's lots of stories like this. I'm going to call on a couple more of my colleagues who are here today. I'll talk about other aspects of, again, what I call medical cancel culture, different ways to silence us from bringing the truth to patients. Thank you. Dr. Erzo and then Dr. Todaro. Yeah. Would you, yeah, would you like to share your, your yeah. medical, again, absolutely. thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I wasn't quite sure we were doing that this time, but, but yeah, so when this first started out, I was not uh, uh, in line with the thinking of we should lock down, isolate. This is, this is early March, and I think I had read some of the early studies on, on SARS, and I'd seen that they had been pretty successful with chloroquine. And at the time, um, I, I started looking at more of the literature, and as it got into March, I realized that um, locking down wasn't wasn't uh, necessary. In fact, I was so un, I was so naive at the time. I had no idea. I thought I would call a few people. I had some connections with the medical community, pretty pretty extensive actually, in my state. And I thought I could call around and, and let people know, like, hey, we've got a strategy here. It's not bad. We can prophylax, and we could use hydroxychloroquine as a first line therapy. We don't need to lock down. We can protect our elderly with prophylaxis, really low doses. And I, and I actually thought that that was actually going to be well received. Instead, I was told to go home <laughs> and, uh, and uh, to go home and uh, don't use the personal protective equipment because I was just wasting resources. And I literally was on the phone. I won't say who it was, but a fairly well uh, high up person in our, our society in Texas on one of the boards. And I told him, I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 40 something. I said, look, I've been through the AIDS epidemic, okay? We didn't know if we touched the patients what was going to happen. And I go, I've been through another, and that pandemic itself was very eye-opening for me. I was very scared. I was a young doc. And I didn't go home. I went to work. I went to work. I'm going to see patients. So I told them right then, I said, look, I, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but as far as I'm concerned, you're a coward. You go home. You go home. I said, I'm not going home. I'm going to work. I go, I did, I done six years in the ER, 100, 200 hours a month. I, I've been on a bunch of trauma teams. I'm not going home. I'm going to see patients. So uh, that, that turned into uh, a short visits with some of my friends, some of, their, some of my patients who would call me knowing that I had talked to them about this disease. And I ended up treating the disease. And then I got on a Facebook Live video that <laughs> in about two hours reached 100,000 people. And I saw it and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get some repercussions. Sure enough, I did. The board came calling and they said, you said that hydroxychloroquine works um, and you're basically a public menace. Um, and, and, you know, we want to know who you treated. Uh, you said you, at the time, it was really early on, I said treated three patients. Um, and I had to provide all the records, all the information. I was very intimidated, as you might imagine, uh, because, you know, I have to practice. You know, I have to feed my family. I, I love what I'm doing, but, you know, I, I'm not independently wealthy. I, I, I'm, I was a little bit afraid. Uh, I really was. Uh, that lasted about a day. Uh, 
at that point, you know, again, as Simone, as Dr. Gold said, we've got to do the right thing for the patients. And at the time, I wrote a bunch of letters saying, I'm not going to let my patients get on vents and ECMO. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to allow it to happen. I'm going to treat them. I don't care. Uh, well, suffice it to say, um, you know, I got reprimanded. I'm still in, in, in a process of, of negotiation with that whole thing. Uh, but as Dr. Uh, Armstrong said, I'm really not afraid. I know I'm doing the right thing. I've treated a number of patients. I won't tell you how many, because then I'll probably have to provide records for all that. So for the purposes of this statement, I'm going to say I treated three. <laughs> okay. So the board is, the fear of reprisal is the reason why we're in this place right now. Docs don't want to do this. There's a fear of reprisal. I was very worried about it, and I can tell you all the people who believe in this medication, who believe in early treatment, feel the same way. They're really scared to go forward and treat patients because they don't want to lose their medical license, and, and that's a big deal. So the intimidation is amazing. And I'll give you another thought. They took, so what did we find, and I'm, we're going to talk about this afternoon. They did trials on hydroxychloroquine, and they used like 35 milligrams per kilogram instead of six. What they found in those trials, which is the biggest thing that I can say today, what they found, so everybody who's listening, they found that when you use toxic doses of hydroxychloroquine, you get toxic results. That's not smart. Doctors were using thousands of patients, the recovery trial, the solidarity trial, the REMAP study, they used toxic doses of hydroxychloroquine throughout the trial. And guess what? Patients did not have good results. So again, I'll reiterate that. Toxic doses, toxic results. And for us, that's part of the reason we're speaking out, because there's a disinformation campaign where they basically won't allow us to use safe, low doses, 200 to 400 milligrams a day, even in the prophylactic area where we can only use, let's say, 200 twice a week. There's been shown to be studies that that's helpful. And instead, I'm afraid to actually prescribe my patients this medicine. And when I prescribe it in Texas, I have to put a diagnosis down, and the pharmacist just a week and a half ago refused to fill it and said, I'm not, I'm not prescribing it. My father was in the hospital, and they thought he had COVID, and I said, well, I want him to get 200 milligrams of uh, hydroxychloroquine. He's in the hospital now. It turned out he aspirated. He was, he was negative. But I said, if he is, I'd like him to get uh, hydroxychloroquine, you know, 200 low dose. And they said, no, we're not going to give it. We will not give it at this hospital. So, you know, the, there's not even a thought about it. As, as Dr. Gold said, this is one of the safest drugs on the planet, one of the most essential drugs on the planet. planet. And I think it's a shame that we have had this argument about safety. It's almost ridiculous. And I've said this before. I don't know a single cardiologist who's ever taken a patient off of this drug for a QT interval problem. And as they were talking, I'm going to say this for people who are listening, QT interval means the heart has to recharge. It beats and then it takes a moment to recharge. That's the QT interval. It slows it down a little bit. Not enough to actually clinically ever affect a single patient, and I've had several thousand patients visits in my office for this drug over the last 30 years. I think that speaks volumes to it. That's why I'm not afraid, because I know I'm giving something really safe, and as, as I now know, it is very effective. So we're going to do one more can uh, medical cancel culture story. Um, we share these stories because we feel an obligation to speak out, and we've been asked over and over when people hear this information why we didn't speak out sooner or why more doctors aren't speaking out. So we just want to share with you the pressure that doctors are under to tow a particular line that's being told to us. There is real professional and personal costs to not doing you know, not following the group think, and we just want to share that experience with you. Um, and as we just heard, one of our own doctors wasn't able to get a medication that he thought could potentially be life-saving for his own father, um, a medication that you can just pick up off the shelves in much of the world, which is really very sad. A sad I don't know what you would have done if he had been COVID positive and you had that information. That's just terrible. Anyway, there's many ways to silence physicians, so we're going to hear from our next colleague, Dr. Todaro. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. James Todaro. I'm a residency-trained ophthalmologist, and I've been deeply investigating COVID-19 since about February of this year, 
and really took on, I'd say, a much more central role uh, after co-authoring, I guess, the, the first widely disseminated paper uh, on hydroxychloroquine as a potential treatment uh, for COVID-19. Um, many of you may have heard of this document. It was the one that was tweeted out by Elon Musk, his 34 million followers, and then just a few days after the president was talking about hydroxychloroquine to the nation. Uh, since then, we know that there's been a, a substantial amount of evidence now showing hydroxychloroquine to be not just safe, which we already knew, but also effective. And there are many ongoing clinical trials still today. Yet if you were to try to read that original document that we published, you wouldn't be able to. Um, after millions of views, about a week after it was published, Google took it down for violating its terms of service. Um, and it's still down to this day. A couple months later, I wrote another article called The Study Out of Thin Air. This was the article about the Lancet study that was published discrediting hydroxychloroquine. It was kind of a little bit of a deep dive into Surgisphere, which was what we know now is a shell corporation that provided this uh, it's a most likely fabricated data set. Uh, there were reports that people messaged me saying that Facebook continually took down the link to the article. And uh, later, they allowed the link because it turned out to be all be true, of course, and that study was formally retracted just a couple days later. Um, this degree of censorship is happening to not just physicians, but people everywhere on social media platforms. We have the CEO of YouTube who openly stated that anything that was said on YouTube that was against the advice of the World Health Organization, which we all know has made a number of mistakes throughout this pandemic, uh, was subject would be subject to censorship. Um, we know that uh, Mark Zuckerberg said the similar thing on Facebook. And, um, you know, this is incredible, and it, it kind of goes to what Dr. Erickson was talking about earlier about the American Republic. Because with the pandemic, with the fear of this pandemic, in the matter of just weeks, we, with, with mandated stay-at-home laws, with rules against public gatherings, we really lost the right to peaceably assemble. So people naturally go to social media platforms, even more so than before, to communicate with one another, to get messages out and learn. Um, and then we're censored there, eroding our, our ability to have free speech. And so what we've seen is in the matter of just a couple weeks, uh, really some of the most fundamental rights of the American Republic being taken away from us. And I think it's incredibly important for Americans to, to resist the loss of these civil liberties. Thank you. Right. Yeah, let, let's hear one more censorship story because, I, I, you know, this is like really important stuff for Americans to understand that there are a lot of doctors who feel censored because of their professional livelihood and personal, you know, death threats. Oh, my gosh, I didn't get a death threat. I guess I should feel lucky. But then the doctors like us who really do want to speak up, we are being censored all over the place. So that's why we're here. Thank you. Yeah, our, uh, when we did our initial press conference, it... Uh, it went to about five million on YouTube, and then they had had enough, so they pulled it down, went into bit shoot, but it got shared so many times they were having trouble because it was getting people had recorded it on all kinds of devices and were resharing. So uh, sometimes when they take it down, that negative attention causes a lot of positive movement. So uh, it got shared all over the place because people are like man, they took it down, it must be good. So it started <laughs> moving all over the place. And uh, Facebook went to 15 million, and uh, to Facebook's credit, they left it on there, but YouTube said no. And uh, the World Health Organization, because we had, we had had some different opinions than, than the opinions they had as far as what people should be doing and how effective some of the strategies were. So they, they decided to take that down. So we were, we were censored uh, from that perspective, but I almost think that the censorship caused an increased spread because all different countries, uh, heads of state were calling, wondering why we were taken down and very interested in the topic at that point because they thought, well, if they're censoring it and it's medical, it's got to be good. So, and I know a lot of people have the same story where you, you're just basically sharing your experience and you weren't trying to do anything radical. You were just sharing sort of raw data in your experience and YouTube said no. I mean, I... I, I want to live in a country where you and I can disagree aggressively, but at the end of the day, we have dinner and we care, each other, care about each other as human beings. I'm happy to have a lively discussion. I love it when people disagree. Let's disagree. Let's, let's hash out the truth. And then let's be human beings and care about each other at the end of the day. And I think a little bit with the cancel culture is losing that. They think if you disagree with me, you hate me. No. 
And, and I, I hope that we can get, Republicans and Democrats can get beyond the, the sort of, you disagree, so you hate me, and we can get into that problem solving mode. So I think that's where we need to be right now, is just focusing on problem solving. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, um, yeah, this is definitely, we, we come to you as doctors, not as people who are really talking about politics. We just want to be able to bring truth and science um, and good policy ideas, you know, to the American people. And so I like, invite my friend Joe Ladapo up, please, to talk with us about some policy perspectives he has. <clears throat> I'm Joe Ladapo. I am a physician and a clinical researcher, scientist, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not UCLA, where I work in Los Angeles. So, um, so really happy to be communicating with the, uh, the public today. And I have been assigned to health policy. So part of, the re part of the way that Simone and I came to know each other, so most of my work, um, so I have, a, I, ha I have a background in health policy and health economics, and I mostly do research. I take care of patients at UCLA Ronald Reagan Hospital, but I mostly do research. And most of my research now is clinical trials, mostly in cardiovascular disease, and, uh, and health economic evaluation. So that's mostly what I do. And then, um, and then COVID came and, you know, and the world decided to, you know, to turn itself upside down in response. And since that time, I've been writing about COVID and our policy responses. And I've, I've, uh, my first article was in USA Today. And, um, and since then, I've written a few editorials in the Wall Street Journal about, about COVID and our response. And, um, and, I, and I'll say that most of, what, um, most of what I've written has been, has reflected what has in fact come to pass, even going back to March, sort of predicting the, not really predicting the future, but thinking about the implications of some of the steps that we were, that we were taking and some of the decisions we were making. And, um, and kind of through that work, Simone and I were kind of connected through even a third party and all these efforts to try and, and bring some light into a place where there was mostly darkness and fear and, and panic. So, so thinking about health policy, which was my assignment. So, uh, so you know what? Obviously, what we've mostly been talking about today is health policy. You know, we've talked about medications, we've talked about lockdowns, we've talked about hydrochloroquine, and we've talked about dissent and how sort of policies that have, how they've, how the policies have approached dissent. And we've talked about schools. So, you know, I, I was trying to think of something that hopefully might be useful that I could, that I could share. And so I, I think I've thought of something, so that's what I'm going to share. So basically, from from what from our discussion, I've 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 made some notes about how I think how I think um, we can think about, and I say we really broadly, the people in this room, the people outside this room who also feel like things aren't quite right, but may not be able to quite put their finger on it on what's wrong, but how we can um, can can shift toward the light uh, instead of the darkness and the fear and all that. And so these are some thoughts, and some of these have been expressed already. So, um, so lockdowns. So in terms of the, the people that, that advocate for lockdowns, that, so just recently, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel and a bunch of other physicians and, and other healthcare workers sent a letter, an open, wrote an open letter saying that, um, that we need to shut it all down and do it, you know, and then and, and start over and do it again. And some people, you know, they believe that. Some other people believe that also, that, that, that we should do that. So, um, so if, if you read the letter, I think it's, it's first, it, it, you know, what struck me, uh, I read the letter, and what struck, what struck me initially, and this is, kind of neither here nor there, but the, the tone of the letter requires 
requires um, um, requires some um, some arrogance to write, in that it uh, it 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 takes um, a position of really knowing what's best for other people, you know, more so than apparently they could possibly know for themselves, and that says something about where we're coming from, and some of these same. Um, writers were the same people who promised that, you know, two weeks to, lot to, to flatten the curve or, and wrote a bunch of things back in March that, you know, that, that um, outlined what we, you know, if we do this, then basically then we will be okay. You know, that's essentially was the bottom line. And that this was, you know, was in, you know, the, the extreme versions of lockdowns and mandates and this and that. And, you know, and, and, and not only were they wrong, but now they feel it's okay to say the same things and, and expect that they will be right. And, and people should pay attention to the fact that when we started this thing, it started from, you know, we're going to, you know, just, just eight days or whatever, however, however many days the president and some of the other, other people threw out was how many days we needed to lock down. And then that became two weeks, and then you know, and then everyone knows the 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 rest of that story. And so you know, so I just I hope when people look at that, and it's so easy because of the fear, the uncertainty, the feeling of being lost and kind of spinning around, that really is affecting a lot of people, including leaders right now. They really are struggling to find direction. It's easy to believe that something might work when it doesn't make sense for it to work. So these same people, you know, that the, these um this open letter that that they wrote about doing the lockdowns again, you know, it I you know, it's important for when they when other people tell you, you know, out there talking to people out there in the public that this is really what we need to do, you know, it's it's important to ask people whether Right now, there's still a lot of fear, but there's less than there was back in, you know, back in March and back in April. So if you, I mean, so if you, if, if in, a, in a period of just pervasive fear and a ton of people staying home and avoiding contact, you couldn't stop the virus, I mean, what in heaven's name makes you think that you can try again now when a good portion of people are over it and just oh, just don't feel that they can sustain, you know, locking down and be successful. It is absurd. And just like it didn't work when they, you know, promised that that was exactly what they need, we needed to do in the New York Times and Washington Post and all that back in March, it would not work now. So it not working is one reason why uh, not to not to listen to people who are saying that. But there are other reasons too. You know, another reason is 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 the is the product of panic. So just like in March, right? When um, you know, I listened to Governor Newsom. Uh, I was I was working in the hospital basically that week that he decided to lock things down in California, and and listening to him. I was just astounded, and it wasn't just him. It was, it was, you know, contagious. It was really everyone. I was astounded about how people were talking about this, you know, this, this, this profoundly powerful policy intervention of locking things down, without like hardly giving a breath to the consequences outside of the virus. It, you know. I was blown away. I mean, it's it, it's 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 stunning because you know if you if you were going to operate on someone and amputate their leg because of some cancer that had spread or because of you know because of some medical condition like peripheral vascular disease or something, you would talk about the side effects. You know, well. Obviously, you know, walking is going to be difficult, you know, and we're going to have to do these steps, and, and these are the things we're going to have to think about. But people were, that conversation was not happening. And if it was happening, it was like really, really quiet. It basically wasn't happening. And that's, um, that's what happens when you have panic, which is what we had. So, um, so 
you know, as people are, you know, as some circles are, some corners are ratcheting up the, the panic, it's, um, it's important to, you know, just kind of give them a little shake and ask, well, what about the consequences? Well, what do you think, you know, is it, you know, what, if we did that, what would it mean for, um, you know, what would it mean for, uh, you know, people who are, you know, who have a business or who, um, you know, who are lonely or who, you know, are already maybe using drugs more because, you know, so thinking about the, 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 the side effects of, of these policies, like just simple stuff. Um, and, um, and then, and okay, so there. So then in treatment, right? So, so, um, you know, so one of the, one of the, um, One of the unusual things about periods of crisis and panic is that, again, you know, people just, people have a hard time thinking in just not very basic ways, just, just thinking, you know, just thinking openly. And so, you know, here we are, you know, an incredible country, you know, incredibly productive country, and we are still hearing about shortages. Like that is, you know, someone can give me a word to, to fill in the blank. That's just, you know, it's just, <laughs> just, you know, I just, it's somewhere, it's, this, it's a word that is a mix of like laughable and, and you know, and stunning and, and unbelievable and, and, you know, throwing some um, incredulousness in there. And, and that's, that is, um, that's, that's true. And, but instead of, uh, instead of the public demanding that, that no, it doesn't make sense. Why are there shortages? It doesn't make sense. Like, no, you know, and just saying no to that and like fix it and, and, and that, and period. And, and no more of that conversation of shortages. We have continual conversations about, you know, uh, you know, not everyone can get this particular medication because we might not have enough. And people who want PPE, well, we may not have enough of that. So, so, so please use a cloth, you know, mask that for which there, there is, you know, sort of empirical um, experimental evidence that, that, um, that uh, um, droplets are reduced, but, but um, sort of no, um, little compelling uh, sort of clinical trial or or even higher levels of observational data evidence, and also some evidence against them. So this just this 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 belief that or, and this failure to question the continual shortages is um, is just another part of the the bizarre you know mental climate that we we have right now and apparently are will continue having until people start asking questions and stop you know and stop accepting just stuff that doesn't make sense and so i so i encourage you to to stop accepting things that don't make sense um and um, and you can pull me off. I'm just going to keep going through my list. Um, so, um, so you know, so 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 I am also guilty of of the um, of the you know the sins that I've described. So when when clinical trials when the trials started coming out saying that um, hydrochloroquine was harmful, unsafe, you know, causing all these bad things, and and also not effective. I was, you know, I, I, I read my publications and I say, okay, okay, so that's that. And, and I would think, well, you know, I don't know why people are continuing to advocate for this, why doctors are continuing to talk about it, uh, you know. So, so there, there I was, and there I was not turning on my brain to think about the fact that, um, that uh, first, um, hydrochloroquine has been around for a long time. You know, I've you know, I may, I probably have prescribed it at some point for uh, malaria pro prophylaxis for people. Uh, this is something that, you know, 
ton of patients who have an autoimmune disease have been using for a long time. And, and if I had been thinking, and I'm really grateful that some of the people in this room um, not only have firsthand experience, but were thinking about the fact that, that you know, all this experience doesn't match up with what these high-profile publications in like the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet are saying and called, uh, and, and called, uh, called these uh, publications in the, on the discrepancy. But I wasn't thinking, so I was like, okay. So I, so I accepted what, um, what I read and thought that it what, probably wasn't effective. But thankfully for our colleagues, you know, there's, there are, there are um, you know, the, the very, for the people, despite the fear and the panic, it is compelling to know that, you know, that this medication had no significant safety concerns compared to other medications until now. And that, that's not right. It tells us something. It tells us that something is off. Now, what that thing is off, what that off thing is, you know, I don't want to speculate on right now, on, uh, but um, uh, just because some of it is salacious, but, um, but something is off, right? So that's, that's easy to see given the fact that a medication has been um, successful for, you know, been used with, you know, a comparable safety profile to other medications until now. Um, and um, so that's one important point, I think, to communicate to the public. Something else that's different about, um, about the doctors that are really passionate about, about hydrochloroquine that really, again, is important for, for people in the public to, to know is that, you know, you know we, we, we have these issues where, um, where some treatment or some treatment is, is thought to not be evidence-based and maybe there are a few docs at the outs, you know, at the periphery that still want to use it, and you know, and they might be sort of disparaged um, or name or called names, but sort of, you know, but fine. And and there's just something wrong with those docs. What's very different about this is that that the doctors who use it and believe in it are numerous and passionate. So this is not the same thing as like the controversial vitamin infusions that, you know, that sometimes catch the eye of like of media and and uh, medical boards. Like this is very different. And I think that is a message that that resonates that can resonate if it's communicated in in that in in a in that way with the public. Um, this is very different. Um, and I, and it's resonated for me and I've grown to appreciate it. Um, and it's, it, it's really important. Um, and, and then, you know, it's so interesting again. So in medicine, we usually have, you know, we have like almost the, the most common model in the advancement of research is you start from observational studies, people notice relationships, and then you do clinical trials. And then those relationships pan out or they don't. And oftentimes they don't in the clinical trials. And you know, vitamin D so far has been, um, is like an example of this. There are you know, so many studies under the sun that show observational relationships between higher levels of vitamin D and something good, whether it's blood pressure, you know, MIs, heart attacks, um, um, longevity, um, depression, you know, you name it, like cancer, vitamin D reduces whatever that bad outcome is. But the trials have not been, um, have not as been, been, uh, been as supportive. Nonetheless, some people argue that, you know, the reason the trials haven't been as supportive is because maybe the wrong type of vitamin D was used or this or that or something else. So here with hydrochloroquine, we sort of have an accelerated version of, of the same type of situation where, um, where there are many, 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 many observational studies that show a benefit with early use in COVID-19 and now, you know, and a handful and growing of, of larger trials that have not shown a benefit in general. So, so, so yes, that's true. Um, 
but they're between the observational studies, the uh, the the some of the the um, arguments against the randomized trials, whether it was patients who were getting it later or potentially not with other adjuvants like zinc or um, or other other issues. Um, there's and you know you add on to that the the strong sort of Bayesian belief by practicing physicians who have had many, many patients, um, board certified practicing physicians who've who've seen good outcomes with the medication, there clearly is room. And oh and then the additional thing is just the 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 massive um, just the the, the gigantic gigantism, if that's a word, of COVID and what it's what it's um, uh, what it's doing to us. They're just they're 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 clear there there is room for for people to continue to use it. It's just there's just it just it doesn't make sense that people would not be able to would you know would be threatened uh, physicians would be threatened or or feel um, you know or be or be or be um, barred from using it. It just doesn't make sense. I mean there is some da there's data for there's data exists and we have a big enormous problem and. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, let's keep, give people more time to figure things out. Um, let me see if there's just other things. Um, I see Simone standing up. Should I, should I wrap it up, Simone? Just a couple more minutes, yeah. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll go, okay, all right. Yeah, 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 we love hearing from you. Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, and I think, you know, this one's frustrating, but it, it's, it's, it's very obvious, right, that, that, you know, that, that there are many interested parties in in being on the opposite of wherever President Trump is, right? And and that's part of the hydrochloroquine picture, and that needs to be. I, I think it just it needs to be called out more on the air, you know. That just like, you know, and it almost like almost like a, a question where. Where we can just assess people's honesty, and you know, some journalists I think will be honest and say, "Well, you know, I really don't like the guy, and and, and it gives me pleasure to be on the very opposite side of wherever the heck he is." And that's that's you know, great. So let's you know, let's hear that. And and some dishonest journalists will say that um, say that that's not affecting their you know how they're they're uh, they're you know treating hydrochloroquine. And uh, and hopefully the the American people will be able to see that. But that's another thing that that needs to be called out. Something else. So um, so the other day a friend of mine sent me a video of a debate between um, Erlen, uh, Alan uh, Dershowitz and um, or Horowitz. Which one is it? Thank you. Okay. Woo. All right. And uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. about COVID nineteen vaccination, and it was um, it was really amazing. Alan, I have just high regard for his intellect. I appreciate him because he is an original thinker, which we've lost. There's like the stock of original thinking has gone down, down, down during this pandemic, and um, and. And I appreciate uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. because he is, he has, um, he is, he is passionate and, um, and his passion is combined with uh, facts and, um, and, you know, and a, um, you know, and a real passion for doing good. That um, that that led to a really just knock your socks off debate about COVID nineteen vaccine, which was the pretense, but really they ended up talking about a lot of different things. And what was really great about this debate is that Robert F. King Jr. raised facts. He brought out some things I, that, and I'm not saying 100 percent of what he said was is factually accurate, but a lot of things he said were not only accurate, but things that I had no idea about and made me think harder about, um, about how we think about vaccinations, which, you know, I, I've got three kids, we do the vaccinations. Um, uh, so it's not, so, and it's not, and I would not necessarily stop, but he raised some, some really important questions that we don't hear about at all. 
but are facts and people should know, even if it makes it a little bit harder for doctors to convince patients to get vaccines or for companies to make money by the, from the number of mandated vaccines. And, and I think that's actually what you, we need for hydrochloroquine. You need, we need debates. Like debates between people who are, you know, who take care of patients with this and have um, an understanding of the data that have been published so far, both randomized control trial and observation of the studies, and people who believe that, you know, that, that, um, that it is not the answer and there's something wrong with it. And that kind of debate, those kinds of debates will, when viewed by people, they'll, it just, it will make it easier to understand. Um, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's certainly, uh, I will concur that we are treating COVID-19 and hydroxychloroquine as it's a uh, sui generis, a completely unique event. Uh, we don't handle anything like this in medicine. It's been very bizarre, actually. I want to go back uh, just a moment for when we were talking about the medical cancel culture. We had one more story that uh, the speaker couldn't speak until just now, and I'm going to introduce Dr. Scott Jensen uh, coming to us from Minnesota, and he's going to talk about his experience uh, with cancel culture, the specific reasons he'll mention, but we're going to get to the specific reasons what triggered the cancel a little bit later, but right now we're just going to talk about the chilling effect that this is having on physicians. As per, doc as per our previous speaker, uh, you know, when doctors can't talk straight to the American public or to their patients, we're really all in trouble. Thanks. Welcome, Dr. Dr. Jensen. 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 Okay. okay, can you hear me okay? okay. okay. Yes. Yes. I'm not certain that we're transmitting, so... No, we are. Yes, yes, we are. We hear you fine. Simone, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you fine. Yes. Okay, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Thank you. My name is uh, Scott Jensen. I'm a family physician in Minnesota, and I serve in the Minnesota states. Over the last three weeks, I found myself to be under investigation by the Board of Medical Practice in Minnesota because of allegations that my willingness to compare COVID-19 with influenza has been reckless advice. And I've also been accused of spreading misinformation because I've questioned the way we have been advised to complete medical certificates, death certificates in regards to what's the underlying cause of death. I think what's happening more than anything is that there seems to be no room for a contrarian narrative. And what surprises me most is that in the field of medicine, we've moved in that direction. I've been practicing medicine for more than 35 years and I've always been proud of the fact that the medical profession looks to always bring a level of rational thought, inquisitiveness, and Socratic questioning to the table. It's disappointing to watch our profession become fractured. I've been accused by physicians of saying something that's unacceptable when all I was saying was that which Dr. Fauci might have said, or perhaps Dr. Mike Osterholm. When I question the manner in which we'd been advised to complete death certificates by the Department of Health and CDC, I was accused of spreading misinformation by physicians. And some of them were physicians that had probably not completed much more than a couple of death certificates in their whole career. So this is where I find myself. I believe that America more than ever needs contrarian narratives, we need to think outside the box. We need to not give in to the power and the magnetic draw of groupthink. And that's why I'm pleased to support your efforts, Dr. Gold. This is important to have a white coat summit, to have physicians encourage one another to step up and 
be the kind of rational thinkers we've always been. Lead the way. Empower patients to be their own best champion. Thank you. I'd be glad to stand for questions. Could, Dr. Jensen, will you, uh, we just say again, so you, you did something that kind of disagreed with the group think in how you manage the death certificates, death certificates. Yeah, yeah. which we'll get to later. But the effect on you was to be questioned by your state medical board? Was, was, is that what happened? Yes. Yes, I pointed out that the communication from the Minnesota Department of Health provided information that was in direct conflict with the way we'd been completing death certificates previously. If something contributes to a death, there is a separate box, part two, where contributing conditions should be listed. But in the Department of Health information, they identified that if it was COVID-19 that was seen as something that contributed, it should be listed as a cause of death. But if it was something like emphysema or asthma, then you can go ahead and put that in the separate box, part two. When I questioned this, I was accused of spreading misinformation. And so yes, now the Board of Medical Practice is reviewing my conduct, my public comments, and whether or not my medical license needs to be in some way or another affected. So, okay, so, <laughs> Yeah. So this is really shocking. If uh, if I understood correctly, because I I haven't met you in person. I just saw your video online. I think it got over 20 million views. I encourage everybody to watch it, Dr. Scott Jensen from Minnesota. But you had received, I think, Minnesota Family Practitioner Doctor of the Year Award not too long ago. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, in 2016, I was... Oh, okay, and, sorry, and also, I apologize, Luke. Uh, also, you are a state senator in the state of Minnesota, correct? That's correct. You know, I, I mean, this is just dramatic and stunning. This is not business as usual. We're talking about an esteemed physician, really best in class, been practicing for 35 years, beloved by his patients, elected to a state senate, and now you're being investigated for the quality of your medical care, a and you just recently were, were, were disturbed by how they were managing the death certificates, and then now all of a sudden you're being questioned about this? I mean, this is, this is really dramatic stuff. Has he ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen anything like this in your career? I mean, I think people don't realize for physicians, our professionalism is second to none in terms of importance, our reputation. So when something like this happens, it hurts. And it isn't regarding any care I provided my patients. It's because of public comments. And one of my jobs as an elected official is to ask hard questions and to raise challenging issues and to think outside the box. So this has been a real trial for both my wife and I. Oh my goodness, so Dr. Jensen um, and to our viewers, you know, that phrase unprofessional conduct, nobody would like to hear that phrase, but to a physician it holds special terror. The letter I got from our governor in my state, thankfully they haven't come after me yet, I suppose the way they've come after you, but it threatens unprofessional conduct, and that has very specific ramif potential ramifications on physicians. Not only is it a point of personal pride and reputation of who you are as a human being and professionally, but it actually threatens your livelihood. So do you think that this has a chilling effect on how patients and doctors interact or what physicians prescribe for their patients? What, what do you think it happen what happens to the doctor-patient relationship if a doctor is concerned that they might be said Sense they're that having that. unprofessional conduct? I think one of the worst things that can happen is you will see physicians, even though it may break their heart, they may have to step away from encouraging and helping their patients be their own best champion. 
physicians are going to be chilled by what's happening to me because nobody wants to have to go to medical practice inquiry. So when we have physicians wanting to do the best thing they can to help their patients with COVID-19 and to use a medication that may be off-label, which is a practice that's very standard to many of us, physicians may step away from that. And on another level, what we're seeing is regulatory boards and licensing agencies weaponized in such a way that any of us, whether we hold a medical license or a hairstylist certificate, a teacher's license or a nursing license, any of us could be found to be in harm's way simply because someone didn't like the perspective we shared. So it's going to have a chilling, converse, a, a chilling effect on the conversations that we share as a country. To see licensing boards weaponized by activists is a harrowing phenomenon. Yeah. Any other questions? So, Dr. Jensen, I just want to say thank you so much. I think you've really added to the dialogue. I appreciate your time. One, 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 more, one question. more question. As a state senator, what is it that people around the country could do to help doctors? Um, do you, voters? In, in your role, Dr. Jensen, or Senator Jensen, as a state senator, do you have suggestions for what doctors can do um, or people around the country can encourage doctors to do? What, is there anything that can be done at a, at that a we can? Yeah, what, what are the solutions legislatively to protect doctor-patient relationship and doctor's ability to practice medicine without fear of personal or professional repercussions? I think there's two dimensions to the answer. The first dimension is from a legislative perspective, states around the country are going to have to re-examine the guardrails within which boards of medical practice operate. In Minnesota, the Board of Medical Practice right now, in my situation, is simply doing that which they believe they are charged to do. We may have to narrow the focus so that instead of allowing a licensing board to be weaponized, that they would not give this kind of complaint the kind of, if you will, reception that they are and they would simply say no this is groundless this has nothing to do with patient care so we may have to tighten that up but to physicians around the country I would remind all of us of the lessons when we were interns and residents of what it was like to be at Grand Rounds when we sat with our colleagues and it wasn't about holding anyone who disagreed with us in contempt it was about questioning and trying to identify the best questions so we could get the best information and we work together we need as physicians to lead the way to have that kind of honorable debate that honorable discussion we cannot as a as a profession allow our profession to be fractured because we're becoming political we have we're, we're the experts at trying to identify what are the best questions how do we best help our patients we are not the profession that's that will be hands on. It's always been the profession that says whatever it takes to help our patients, whether it's infectious disease, pandemics, heart disease, new imaging tests, medications, whatever it takes, we're going to be there for our patients. We cannot let go of that calling. If we do, then truly as a profession, we've lost our way. Mm. Thank you so much, Dr. Jensen. Okay. Okay. So I think we're going to take a break for lunch, and we will reconvene at about 3 o'clock. Thank you. Are the cameras off? <laughs> Are the cameras off? No. <laughs>